time. Been back in this group since Thanksgiving time, so hopefully had a good Thanksgiving holiday. I had three turkeys at my house and 50 people, so wow. it was a large-scale event, but Thanksgiving is my favorite holiday. Um, okay, so tonight we send out the agenda to everyone, so you all should have um, have that. We have a couple of things on the, a uh, couple of guests that are going to be giving presentations today on economic development and uh, education. Um, so does anybody have any questions on the agenda or the documents that were sent out? No? Okay. Um, all right. The first thing we need to do is review and approve um, the last meeting notes. Um, so we need to, if everybody's okay with it, we can take a motion to a motion to approve the prior meeting minute no, minutes notes. Yeah, there, there are the two sets that we sent out. One was the kickoff meeting back in uh, October, so, and, yeah. then, and then the last meeting. So, yeah, so there are two sets of meeting notes to, to approve. I motion to approve. Can we approve both sets in one motion? One motion. Sure. We motion to approve both sets of meeting notes. Second. Motion and a second. Do you need me to take notes uh, of how detailed do we need to be in terms of who gave the motion, who gave the second? We who, so who gave the we'll, second? Um, we'll, okay. But uh, we'll we'll be getting notes. We'll, oh, you will. Okay. We got All right. Them, yeah. All right. And, and, it's, have, and it's recorded, so if we need to look back, we can see it. So we have a motion and it's been properly seconded to approve the both the prior meeting notes and the kickoff meeting notes. Um, any questions? Questions? Any questions? All right. Eric none. Motion is approved. Um, now, do we need to vote on the motion or just if there's no questions, approve it? Um, or, or you can or, even do it by consensus if, if there's consensus to approve them okay. as, as they were sent out. All right, so uh, since there's consensus, we're going to proceed forward with the meeting notes um, as approved. I think next we're going to go to Patrick for some announcements. Great. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for, for being here. We really appreciate it. Um, I was going to do a little bit of housekeeping um, stuff really quickly. Uh, first, um, I do want to recognize we, we do have some Zoom attendees um, who are joining us, and we do have, I know one staff person at least is, is joining virtually as well. So ideally when we, when we each speak, we will um, try to remember to say our name first and then, and then make our point. I tend to forget to do that, but um, we'll, we'll do our best to, to do that. Um, Huge thank you to, to Kristen for yes. um, organizing the, the place here and the snacks and all that you've given us. This is a great location. This is a really great. It is. It is. It's really welcome. Eugene and I here. We've got it next door. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, no, it's, it's delightful and an honor to host everybody. Wow. And truly, yeah. if you don't eat all the snacks, I'm going to have to employ people to walk next door and deliver them to the eating staff. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So. <laughs> thank you. Um, and if you all didn't find it already, the restroom is through this door and um, by the elevators. Or if you go out and then pass the elevators, but I'm told you can go out through this door. And I was also told this door was locked and you couldn't come back in, but Joanne just proved that wrong. So apparently you can, you can come in that way too. So um, I think that's it. Is everybody able to get onto the Google Drive that we've set up for you all with your information? Nobody's having problems. If you ever do have trouble getting to anything, email us the staff at region3 .a, or region3 at aacounty.org and we'll um, get you. Um, other announcements. Um, I think I have a slide for this, but we do have a questionnaire that we've put out to the public until January 2nd. We've drafted some of those um, initial strategies related to the natural environment based on a, an earlier survey they would put out to the public and then the conversation that we had at our last meeting. So that is out, it's on our Region 3 hub site. Um, share that with your communities, please. If you'd like some digital 
materials that you can put on your Facebook page or whatever, um, let us know and we'll get you any of that, all right? There are also some printed materials on the table back there. Feel free to take some and distribute if you'd like hard copies. Um, our comprehensive zoning application for property owners, we did extend the period that we're taking those applications until December the 15th. So I don't know if any of you know people who are interested in that, but just FYI, that's going on. Um, I do want to, I'm gonna to try to re remember to tell you all at each of these meetings, some of the bills that are going through council that, um, there are some bills that, that council takes up from time to time that address land use. And um, in the past, there's been some question, why is that going on when we have these region plans and these discussions that are going on? The, the council's work does continue even as we go through these planning efforts. And so um, it, it's not shortchanging our process. Um, it's often in response to prior planning efforts that they're going ahead and addressing some legislative efforts to, to do some things. So there are three bills right now that you all might be interested in. One is bill 8623. Um, that is a redevelopment bill. Um, to, to try to set up some flexibility for de defined redevelopment projects in terms of open space, in terms of roads and school, APF, that's adequate public facilities. We'll talk a little bit about that tonight. Um, and, and promoting multifamily use development um, in, in certain uh, development policy areas. So that's 8623, Bill 8623. Um, Bill 8423, that is the uh, Odenton Town Center Master Plan is being updated. That's not in our region, but it is immediately adjacent to our region, uh, just below Severn. So if you all are interested in that, go take a look at the draft master plan for the Odenton Town Center. And then Bill 7823, that is um, the essential worker housing bill. It's essentially a um, uh, an MPDU bill. Um, um for to to require some um some workforce housing development along with residential developments so that is a bill that you all might be interested in taking a look at as well yes would um learning more about the odenton town center be of any interest related to the Glen Burnie town center i mean in terms of like seeing what they develop yeah. potentially the town Glen Burnie is a little bit different than our, we have three town centers in, in the county and Glen Burnie is a little bit different than the other two. The other two have um, defined master plans for kind of a larger area, whereas the Glen Burnie town center doesn't exactly have um, a very different, uh, a, a master plan that kind of defines a different set of development regulations for a defined area around the Glen Burnie town center. But it is a recommendation in the general development plan to develop such a thing for the Glen Burnie area. So, um, yeah, it may be it may be worthwhile just for for your own knowledge to take a look at the Odenton Town Center master plan as it's drafted, and um, and think about how that might how you think it might be appropriate to do What's something the like third that. One? Glen Burnie Parole Glen Town Center by Parole Town Center by Annapolis. Parole. Parole. Mm -hmm. And the, the uh, Glen Burning one, just is it the the age is why it doesn't have its own master plan? Um, to be honest, I'm not sure that I can fully know the history on that because there used to be a designation and a and a, a master plan for that area. We'll talk a little bit tonight about um, about some of the planning work that is starting to pick up again for that area. The, there has been a, a, a a little planning effort that one of our guests is going to talk about tonight. So we'll we'll get into Glen Burnie a good bit more starting tonight and then continuing through some of our other meetings as well. So I think those are really my main announcements. Um, going back to this great meeting space, um, I do want to put it out there. And I don't need an answer right now, but if you all know, uh, I would like for us to be able to meet in different parts of the region if we can. If you all have connections to decent meeting spaces that can fit um, a table with, for, for you all, the committee, but also space for the public to join us and to observe, I would love to, to hear that if you all have any connections to our meeting spaces. Okay, let's, let's talk either afterwards or you can email us or 
what have you. Okay. Great. I think those are all the announcements I have, right? Yes. Um, okay. So I think we are going to go into our first presentation, I believe. No. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so like this was just the slide of the of what you you had mentioned, or is this part of the presentation? Yeah, I think Patrick mainly covered this stuff, the planning process, but just that we had that survey out for the the visioning um, the visioning statement vision statement. We had a survey out for that. It closed. We also have currently the the strat the uh, survey out for the draft national environment strategies, and we also had the drop in session. On November 28th, a couple of you stopped by, so that was great. Um, and then that questionnaire will close on January 2nd. So I think Patrick kind of covered this already. So, so um, this slide, I'm Desiree, by the way, Desiree Williams. So, um, this slide uh, gives the lineup for some of our next SAC meetings. So obviously today we'll be covering economic development and schools. Um, our January meeting will be housing and redevelopment. February will be transportation and land use. March, um, land, oh yeah, land use again and zoning. April will be when we really dig into the zoning maps and the applications. Um, and then May will continue the zoning maps and review the draft plan. So that's kind of the, the schedule for the the next several months here and how we're, we're kind of laying it out. And then after each of these um, meetings we have, we'll have the follow-up to, you know, we'll, we'll put out a survey kind of going, rolling through each of the strategy, strategies that we develop at each of these meetings. So we'll have a drop-in for housing and economic development um, in late, late in, later in January. And then we'll have a drop in again for the public trans for transportation and land use in April. So we're kind of we're going to group some of these topics together, but then have opportunities for the public to weigh in on those strategies that we develop. Um, and then, yeah, draft zoning maps will be June or July time frame. So would it be helpful for you all for us to send out um, calendar invites for these meetings? Like, yes, for, yes, yeah, we'll absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay, we can do okay. that. Yeah. I had a question about some of the documents. Should we, um, as we represent our communities here, should we assume that the documents can be shared within our community, or are there any documents that should not be shared, or should we make the assumption that they should not be shared? Yeah, I would say make the assumption that it's internal unless said otherwise. So yeah, like some of the, especially when we get into zoning and into the draft plan, I mean, right now the strategies are pretty loose and we're putting those out as we, you know, as we come up with them or putting them out to the public, but everything should be internal um, and really discussed at these meetings just for Open Meetings Act purposes too. Um, and then, yeah, we'll, we'll get it out to the public when it's more at a draft stage. It, yeah, and I'd say to, to give you all a chance to weigh in first, you all are the, the first cut at at these these documents, these strategies, all of that. Cool. Okay, so since we are talking to a lot of different county agencies here, I just briefly wanted to show an org chart. Um, not going to spend too much time on this one, especially since it's just kind of the overarching here. But um, as you can see, you know, the county operating agencies are kind of the core county agencies. Um, and we also have the internal support agencies, which support us. They all report up to like the CIO and the executive. So we have, you know, public works, rec and parks, planning and zoning. We all kind of coordinate together and we'll be coordinating together on these plans. We also have um, some of the you know, quasi-governmental agencies, like some we're hearing from today, economic development. We work with Arundel Community Development Services. So those are more of our quasi-governmental agencies that aren't that are, you know, directly reporting to the CAO, but they're sort of affiliated with the county. So um, we work closely with those, those agencies. So just to drill in more can to you, can you go oh, back there for a second? I, sure. I was looking for where the Office of Planning and Zoning is in there. So right we're there. here. 
Okay. So we have kind of, yeah, rec and parks, transportation, oh. emergency management. Those are kind of our core agencies. And then these are some of the quasi government here. And then these are more, you know, internal support. So budget, personnel, those kind of agencies. So this gives you kind of the overarching <laughs> picture here. Um, any other questions on the, the diagram, but I'm thinking about this and our last meeting in our last slide, when we have the other sectors who are pretty far, you know, had their plans approved and are coming, you know, now into bringing it forward in front of the body. And as we talked about last time, there are so many things that are happening that are right on the edge of the different lines. Um, are there, when we go over those sections, so like we went, we're talking about transportation and the thought was, we're going to create another bus line from Brooklyn into Glen Burnie um, that doesn't exist today. Like if that was recommended, would that be brought up in our section time as well? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, definitely. We, yeah. So re region one is moving forward at the same time on the same timeline as we are. And region one is Brooklyn park, Lenticum, um, Curtis Bay. It's, so it's the, maybe it was the one on the, um, the Laurel side that, is ahead of us. Region two, Region right. Region yeah, that's Jessa, Laurel, all of that is going to adoption in January, probably, or February. Okay. Uh, all of these plans, though, are fitting together under the framework that is set by the countywide general development plan. So it, it's, it's an attempt to kind of drill down regionally but um, but I, your point is taken. You know how do we coordinate across the the lines? Ideally, that we should be fairly well coordinated countywide. Um, yeah, we may have to on a case by case basis kind of coordinate on certain things across region lines as well. And some of the detailed stuff. Okay, so <clears throat> honing into office of planning and zoning. Um, at the top, we have. Jenny Jarkowski is our planning and zoning officer. And we have three kind of main divisions in OPZ. So that's planning, development, and zoning. And planning, um, if you're not, if you can read this, sorry, it's a little blurry. Um, we have cultural resources, research and GIS, and long range. So we are in long range planning. So this is a long range planning effort. And then we have the development division which is made up of four section and is in charge of reviewing the development applications as they come in. So they're working you know, with uh, the developers, walking them through the development process. So um, that's made up of the transportation section, residential, regional, which is like commercial and mixed use, and then uh, critical area, which is any property within a thousand feet of tidal waters or wetlands. Um, and then we have the zoning division, which is made up of the zoning administration zoning administration section. So they deal with things like variances, administrative rezonings, thus, you know, special exceptions, that kind of stuff, or the zoning enforcement section. So they're driving around and making sure everyone's doing the right thing. So um, so this yeah. that easel to the right a little bit because it's blocking oh, yeah. some of the I'm not that better. Wow. <laughs> Does anyone have any, any any questions about this? So we we you know this is made this planning effort is really a long range planning effort, but you know development division is oftentimes implementing a lot of what our recommendations are. Um, that's part of implementation is, is kind of coordinating with them. And then there are a lot of plans implementing some of our, of our recommendations, so. Okay, so I guess at this point, I'll pass it off to Kyle. Let me, or do we have, do you wanna, did you have an intro? I have a couple of, okay. I have a couple of slides that I wanna jump into first before we, before I turn it over to you, if I may. Um, so, <laughs> Just to set the stage, so we are going to hear from, from Kyle Roth, who is the director of facilities for the schools. Um, 
schools are really a, a countywide issue. And so most of the land use policies that we'll deal with as relates to schools, those most of those were sort of addressed in the general development plan, which was adopted a, a couple of years ago. But um, and, and those kind of address schools at a countywide scale. But I, I think it is helpful to really understand the connection between our schools and the school's needs and particularly facilities needs and our land use planning and how growth and development really impacts um, schools and, and school capacity and all of that. Um, so our, our friend from the public schools will give an overview of some of the redistricting that you all are working on and the capital projects um, that are coming up in this region. But um, really quickly, I wanna talk a little bit about, I mentioned adequate public facilities earlier, APF. Um, you'll hear that acronym a lot if you haven't heard it already. But school APF, this was mentioned briefly in that background paper that we sent out to you all. So if you had a chance to take a look at that. Um, APF really, the, the standards and the requirements that um, address adequate public facilities, they really help direct growth to where infrastructure, and in this case, schools, we should do APF testing for other things as well. Um, but we try, to, we try to direct growth to where infrastructure is existing or where it's planned. And certain developments, they have to pass um, testing to ensure that there's adequate school capacity prior to those development proposals being approved by our office. Um, I realize I'm standing in front of the screen. Um, so the Office of Planning and Zoning, we report the, the number and the, the type of dwelling unit that any development project um, proposes, we, we, um, we make reports and we give that to the Board of Education and they generate utilization charts of projected enrollment to show whether different school feeder districts are, um, ha have the capacity to, uh, to, to handle the development or whether there are vacant seats within each of the schools. And so this determines whether those schools and those feeder districts are what we call open or, or if they're closed. And if a school district is, a feeder district is closed, then what happens is that proposed developments um, of a certain criteria within that feeder district, if it's closed, then proposed developments can be put on hold from approval for up to six years. And that's ideally to give, um, to give the county and the, the Board of Education time to to uh, build facilities or otherwise meet the capacity needs of the schools ahead of those developments being, being approved and coming online. So um, yeah, some of the projects meeting certain criteria that are outlined in, uh, in our development regulations in the code, some of those are not subject to APF testing. Um, and the, there are details, it's detailed in the code, but certain projects that are within, say, the Parole Town Center are not um, subject to APF testing. There are a slew of other conditions where it's just been determined that it's um, either there's, there's not a significant impact anticipated from certain types of development or the overall goals of, cert of having certain types of residential development supersede the, the need for um, school capacity. So um, those, are, those are some things that are um, addressed with our APF legislation. And so that's what I was going to say to kind of set the stage. I'll let you come and talk about the schools. So, good evening, Kyle Roof, Director of uh, Facilities for the Public Schools. Um, so the first thing I wanted to talk about is kind of provide an overview of the redistricting effort that we're undergoing. So adjusting school boundaries is one of the key tools to balancing the capacity and enrollments between our schools. So AACPS um, is currently implementing phase one redistricting that was approved in November at the board meeting. And this is going to take effect in the 24-25 school year. And then we're also planning phase two of redistricting which will be implemented in the 26, 27 school year. So in phase one, all the schools in the study area are projected to not exceed capacity. And without redistricting, we had 13 schools up here, it's a seven and six. 
uh, that would be overutilized. This one thing down. You have to hover over the. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, some of the key dates for implementation of phase one redistricting are shown up on the screen. So the legacy portal uh, will be closing in January, and then we'll also be renaming two of the new schools, so West County Elementary School and then Old Mill West High School will be renamed in the next month or so. And I'll go for board approval. During the months of February through roughly July 1st, we'll be doing bus routing. So all those kids that got redistricted will have to have new bus routes and uh, we'll be running those through the GIS system to, to get those routes established. And then uh, we have the master plan that gets published in June of each year. And then finally redistricting takes effect for the start of the uh, school year in September. So phase two will start in February of uh, 2025 and it'll follow a similar timeline that we did for phase one. So, uh, February web tool will be released. The public has input uh, through the web tool itself. And then uh, we'll review those comments, make adjustments as needed. And then the superintendent will give uh, an update in the summer. And then the board will uh, process its vote and public hearings through the fall. And then final adoption in November. And again, implementation the following year. So our capital budget request for this year is $234 million with 172 million going for major capital projects and then roughly 62 million requested for reoccurring programs. Those are uh, the reoccurring programs are smaller scale projects uh, such as systemic renovations of HVAC systems or different components in existing buildings. Uh, one of the, the major Items that we're working on is completion of the old mill master plan. So once this plan is fully implemented, we'll have spent close to $970 million. And it started the process in 2015 with the start of the strategic facilities master plan, also known as the MGT study. And we had the old mill master plan came out of that study in 2016. And then we started a slew of construction projects. So anything in blue is under construction right now in design phase. And we estimate completion provided funding is in place uh, for the 28-29 school year. Just kind of an overview of the old mill master plan. This is uh, uh, this is Papa John's farm. Uh, used to be. Now it's Old Mill West High School. We have Rip, uh, Quarter, Quarterfield Elementary School. This is the CAT Center right now. It will be turned into Old Mill North Middle School. We'll do a replacement of Old Mill High School where the baseball softball fields are right now. Uh, CAT Center will be located next to where Old Mill South Tower is at the existing high school. Rippling Woods is completed. And then Southgate Park is Old Mill South Middle School, and that will be open for next year. Uh, so Old Mill High School, uh, our request this year is for $69 million, 26 million from the county and 43 million from the state. Um, so the proposed project will have an SRC, it's scalable. We made it so that uh, we could use it for redistricting purposes. We can make it larger and smaller based off the number of students that are going to be enrolled there. So it can be between 1882 and 2137 as far as the number of seats in the building. Uh, next project is Old Mill Middle School North. Again, that will be located at the existing CAT Center, and the proposed enrollment is 1270. Um, another item that is coming due is our long range plan. As mentioned with the old mill master plan, we had the old one, 
done in 2015. The new one's coming due. We like to do these every 10 years. So in the FY25 fiscal year, we'll be uh, redoing that plan, going out for solicitation. The RFP is currently on the street um, so that we can get a consultant on board to help plan out the next 10, year, 10 years of capital projects for us. I'll hand it over. Do we want to take any questions that you might have for, for schools related to Region 3? Does the old mill plans affect um, road development? Um, change the road patterns? There'll be a few. Uh, there's a couple uh, transportation projects associated with the old mill south. Um, so Old Mill Boulevard is that main boulevard, then Old Mill Road, it's more of a residential road. There's a couple of projects designed to add traffic lights, also access to the school from Oakwood. So uh, one of the entrances for the bus traffic is going to be off of Oakwood to get to the bus loop. And there'll be some design changes with the transportation infrastructure on that. So, um. North is staying remaining where they where it's at, Old Mill North. So okay. the other middle school. Yeah, so right now Old Mill North is right here with the complex. It will be moved over to the cat center. Okay, so they were, and then moving the cat center over there near just reversing everything. Reversing. So um south will open next year. Okay. As soon as school's out this year, we're gonna take down that tower so I can build the cat center. Cat center is literally gonna be when it's completed 50 feet from uh, Jason from the, the uh, high school, the other whole, the high school, the high school. Yeah, the old high school. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I just wanted to know how it's all yeah, working. It's a lot of moving parts. Yeah, yeah. this was like, okay. So. Um, I know you asked about roads, but uh, residential sidewalks in those areas, I noticed a lot of the, the, high, yeah. the schools in Anaheim County don't have sidewalks in front this of This is actually a very walkable area. Right. So if you look at the walk map for the high school area itself, it's pretty well yeah. with the sidewalks. Uh, there will be some additional sidewalks that will need be needed over in the Old Mill South area. Stevenson Road, <laughs> we are actually putting a frontage sidewalk on New Cut for the high school with SHA. And then there'll be a small chunk of sidewalk that needs to be added on Stevenson to allow this to be walkable. But that's all being planned out with DPW and State Highway. So would it be fair to say that <clears throat> more and more of our land is being used? I mean, larger areas of land are being used for our schools than previously due to I, I think that's population fair. growth? Well, I think it's uh, as far as acreage for what a school site needs to be to to handle all the, the zoning requirements and forest conservation and items like that. that that's definitely true. Um, we need about 60 acres now. We used to be able to have 15 or 45 acres, but 15 of those acres go towards like forest conservation. And then we also have to set aside uh, additional land for stormwater management, all good best management practices for environmental purposes. So the 15 acres would be somewhere else or near the school with the forest? Uh, we, we like to carve out as much as we can from the property itself so that we can set aside forest conservation land with that property. That means you're going to have trees near the schools. Okay. Is Old Mill maintaining its um, STEM status and the, the magnet programs when they're going through these changes? So I, I believe Old Mill South is the STEM school. Yeah. And then Old Mill, I think it's, it's the, uh, the, the BA. They have like yeah, a BA right. program and then like all, yeah, BA. So there, there's, yeah, STEM. there's no changes to yeah. the, the magnet programs uh, at this time. Yeah, and I'll point out, you all were asking a lot of great um, transportation questions and we will be hearing from transportation in February. So we can revisit with those folks as well and dig into some other of the transport transportation related I do have questions. questions. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, I just want to know recreational areas around all those um, because I know how Old Mill is 
piling in all the fields and everything. Um, how are y'all replacing that? Or are y'all positioning that for all the other areas? Because I know that all of them being together, they had maybe like four or five fields they'll be able to use. So what are you going to do with those areas? And then also how are y'all refining that? Because there's a lot of children. There's a lot of children in that main area. Yeah. Um, so I guess uh, from a school perspective, what we will be doing <laughs> is it'll be a little tight here for a while until okay. we get the, the old school down. Once the old school is down, that's actually going to be field. Oh, okay. Maybe even it's going to be maintained as is, but we'll rehab it. Um, okay. It more ADA accessible. This site will be fully operational starting on day one, which is kind of unusual for our new schools. Usually we have a one to two year grace period where all the fields need to kind of rest before we can get on and with this one we've able we've been able to accelerate the fields so if you drive by that site you'll actually notice the stadium is done uh, the grass field turf is down we're watering it um, so it should be ready to go come fall um, as far as a parks and recs which is one of our main partners that we like to partner with um, they'll be able to use these facilities for off hour use oh okay all right is there a correlation between student performance and new facilities or renovation? Does that like all of a sudden do the students actually perform better? And if so, how could that ripple effect go into like investing in the underperforming student schools? Uh, we have not done a study as far as student performance. There's been national studies that have said that you know a better learning environment is conducive to better test scores and such. Uh, one thing I can say is a lot of the old mill complex itself was the open classroom environment. We had very few walls inside the buildings. Rippling Woods was one of those prime examples where you walked in. We basically had cubicle walls uh, separating the classrooms. Now we actually have solid classroom walls where the sound doesn't travel throughout the building. You're able to have more pullout spaces for these kids to get additional services and support. Um, so I... Anecdotally, I can say, I believe that there is correlation and uh, hopefully, you know, with the continuation of funding, we can uh, spread that to the rest of the county. Two questions for you. One was you, you commented on um, the, the turf coverage. Um, curious artificial versus natural substance and um, what, what we did from an environmental impact study on that or what, how our decisions are made? Uh, decisions for that are made uh, basically on usage. Uh, so our minimum right now is two artificial synthetic turfs at each high school. And the reason that we do that is for playability purposes and to get as much use and uh, not only from a Rex and Park standpoint, but also from a high school athletic standpoint. Um, there are other complexes, Annapolis for one, that's a high usage site that has more synthetic turfs. As far as environmental standpoint, it's all factored into when we do stormwater management, when we do all those best management practices as far as how we treat the water on site to make sure that we're not creating more impervious surfaces than what we can treat. Um, thank you. Curiosity on the other side of that is all, always there are now statistically more injuries on yeah. the artificial surfaces versus the natural surfaces. So maybe we'll see a, a trending back to that. Yeah, uh, what we're we're doing is uh, there's a test called GMAX that you can base uh, use it for determining what the, the impact is for the students. And it really goes into how well you're maintaining those surfaces, how well they're groomed um, so that the impact is less. Um, it's all, it's all relative to based off of operation and maintenance, even for natural turf. If you're not aerating that field, it could be rock hard depending on where you're at in the county. You could have that hard clay, you could have the soft sand. Yeah, and I've, uh, we, um, <clears throat> I'm on a zero waste um, team. And um, I was informed that most of the synthetic turfs last about eight years. And then you have the problem of what to do with them. And supposedly they can, you know, some of them can be shredded for playground. But the problem is there's toxic chemicals in there. And every time you try to repurpose a synthetic turf, you're releasing more of those toxic chemicals in the environment. So eventually there's going to have to be another solution. 
And that's just the easy solution, but it's not really the best solution. Also curious on an econ as you've done these shifts with the different campuses from an economic development standpoint, the businesses that have located, especially for childcare and other things near them, how are we impacting those those businesses, or are we creating opportunities for childcare to to shift um, or other adjacencies that would be appropriate for the, for the youth to shift with our campus shifts? Um, so a lot of the the elementary schools themselves, when you're talking about childcare really have not moved. It's more of the secondary schools that are shifting. So the CAT Center shifted, Old Mill South, Old Mill North moved. Um, but Rippling Woods is really largely located right on the same area that that one was, and Quarterfield was built right behind the existing Quarterfield. So we, we try to keep as much as possible the elementary schools in their existing locations. But with that said, Blueprint is expanding pre-K education throughout the county. We're gonna have to look at existing facilities to assist with that need that exists for pre-K. So that includes looking at all, some more of the space that's available in our existing buildings, whether that be an elementary school, whether it be from a redistricting standpoint where we free up space, there's additional classroom space in the elementary school, that's our preferred location. Was there any um, thought in this process into um, private, daycare facilities, like before and after care, um, and like coordination with like the YMCA of Central Maryland, which I know does a lot of before and after care at some of the high schools, because when you expand the high schools, that there's a need for before and after care um, for the community. Um, as far as before and after care, uh, we, we like to partner with Rex and Parks for our before and after care. All of our uh, elementary schools that we built have a special room for before and after care purposes. We can repurpose it during the school day for a classroom space, but it it's a community space that we get extra money from the state for uh, before and after care purposes. I know we talk about oatmeal, but no. I do have a thought about Glen Burnie. Like, um, or do you have a plan that's structured towards, you know, doing dividing and conquering Glen Burnie alone? Because it's such a big campus, and I know like it's going to take more work than a little. But do y'all have a plan to update that facility? Because well, we need to like, definitely. Yeah, it's, it's, we're working on a multi phase plan for that right now. It doesn't involve tearing down or replacing any of the existing buildings, but it involves systemic okay. renovations yes. to the yes. buildings itself. So, um, if you've driven by, you, you've seen us on our lifts trying to redo the facade for a lot of those buildings, the brickwork. Uh, we're redoing the roofs, the windows are getting replaced. Uh, we're in the process of replacing a boiler that powers half the facility right now. Um, so we're, we're trying to be better stewards of the environment, better stewards of the existing buildings. Um, a lot of these upgrades at Glen Burnie are energy efficiency upgrades. So we're switched uh, with that boiler. We're switched from number two diesel to now we're using natural gas. It's not a green fuel, but it but is very, better. Right, it is better, um, efficient, okay. Efficient uh, use of uh, our resources. So, okay. But again, the, uh, the next 10 year plan will kind of lay out where we're going as far as building. A question about, um, in the document that was sent out ahead of time, it said that the um, Mead High School feeder districts, uh, North County, Old Mill, Glen Burnie, and Mead are closed, right? Um, when you say it's closed, so the, the areas of the county that feed that school are closed for residential development, my understanding. Mm -hmm. right. How is that possible with Mead being where it is and all the development that's happening on not just 175, but Reese Road on all the residential was that already zoned and that now it's just being developed? <laughs> so are we talking about additional zoning or? It, it's a, the, the, um, the school capacity list is something that it's adopted by the council annually. And, and so there's a reassessment every, every year to determine which of these districts are, are open or closed to development. I worry about the for the that Mead High School area with mm -hmm. NSA East bringing so many uh, new families into that area and the, the the boom of and I think that's it straddles two regions there. Um, but there's so much development in that area, but Mead High School is bursting at the seams. Mm -hmm. And so 
how do from a zoning perspective is there a way to adjust some of those those impacts it is it is one of the things that we are going to be looking at with these with these region plans um but i i think was was the mead district affected with this redistricting effort yeah, as well so, so uh one of the main sources of students for Old Mill West was Mead High School. So Mead, uh, Old Mill West is pulling students from North County, it's pulling students from Mead, and it's pulling students across 97 from Old Mill. Um, so there is gonna be a rebalance. There'll be less students at Mead High School itself. Um, as far as sources of students uh, from Fort Mead proper, we have fewer students on Fort Mead proper. Some, some Most of those schools, as far as elementary, middle schools, they're not as heavily overcrowded. Um, when you get to Jessup Elementary School, where a lot of that development is happening, closer to the Howard County line, 175, you do see a larger enrollment in those areas. Um, but again, I think we were able to rebalance a lot of those schools to provide a little bit more cushion. Um, changes in the APF will be brought before the council sometime this spring, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that chart will be revised. At one time, there had been some thought to uh, put another high school in the West County, in, and I'm going to say the far West County, uh, adjacent to Howard County, to accommodate all the growth that had occurred at that portion of the county. Mm -hmm. Is that still on the books or? Uh, we have advanced land acquisition uh, that we pursued uh, to get a site. I don't think that in the next 10 years, there's gonna be a need for that high school site. Uh, we're reserving it for a secondary school site, but we, we do have land over there for that. Oops. Any questions? Let, let me hold on to it. I'll, I'll introduce, uh, got a couple of slides I'm gonna run through. Turn it over to you. Um, thank you very much. We, we appreciate that. Um, before we get into hearing from our friends at uh, in Anne Arundel Economic Development Corporation, um, I did want to give you a little bit of information about some of some of what we're hearing from the from the public. Um, in some of our earlier surveys and questionnaires that we've put out to the public, um, some of the key themes of public comments that we've heard as they relate to the economy are what you see here. So uh, people in Region 3, there's a, a strong appreciation for proximity to, to jobs and all of various daily needs here, whether it be medical as, as here or entertainment, dining, shopping, all of those things. Um, a lot of comments and, and uh, sentiment about um, underutilized areas and recognizing that there are a lot of places that need revitalization. In Region 3, um, Glen Burnie Town Center came up, but then generally just vacant retail areas and parking lots and how these are, there are opportunities for uh, improved improvements and enhancement of those areas. Um, there's a lot of recognition, and I appreciate this, key needs for low-income households, in particular, in particular three things, um, mobility, childcare, and housing for our, our more low-income households in, in this area. So these are things to kind of, for all of us to be thinking about as we develop strategies for this region. Also access to healthy food, um, that was mentioned in the Severn area. We've also heard of it um, up in the Tanyard area as well. So those of you who live in that area maybe can tell us if, if that sounds off or correct, you know, but we'll, um, you know, just wanted to share some of what we're hearing uh, from people as we move into this discussion. Um, we also consider countywide um, our, our equity context in, in this region. Um, we do live in a pretty affluent county overall, but there are concentrations of poverty. And I think it's important to really think about how those areas of, of higher poverty also intersect with um, our communities of color. 
we know that there's been a history in, in this country and in this area of how planning has adversely affect, affected lower income communities and communities of color. So we, we wanna be mindful of that. This map on the left, it shows um, median household income by census block. And so the lighter shades and the, the white, the, you know, the wider shades, those indicate our lower uh, income areas. And then the map on the right shows the percentage of non-white population in, in uh, region three. And so those darker shades of green are where there's a higher percentage of population that is non-white. And so you can actually kind of see in some areas where some of those, some of those um, start to overlap. And some of those are around say Pioneer Drive, Meat Village, where um, they're predominantly non-white areas. Um, this also shows that there are some relatively diverse and higher income areas in, in the Marley Neck area. And then Glen Burnie, you kind of see a bit of a, of a mix um, in those areas. There's a report that is, um, it's in your drive and it's also on the Region 3 hub site called Poverty Amidst Plenty. And this was developed by the Anne Arundel County Partnership for Children, Youth and Families and the Community Foundation. Um, there's a lot of information and data in that report if you're not familiar with it. Can you repeat the name of it, please? Yeah, it's called Poverty Amidst Plenty. You can, you can also just Google it on, uh, on Google and it'll come up. Um, it, it's updated from time to time. The most recent update was 2022. And so it has a lot of data and information that is really good for us to kind of have in the back of our mind as we think about these, these uh, policies that we're going to end up recommending for this, um, for this area. Um, and it was also, I think this is my slide too. Um, Kayla, you're gonna talk a little bit more about this later, but we, I do, I will point out that we do have a um, sustainable community program that is a state level designation that's applied to, to different geographic areas in existing communities that, provides resources, it helps consolidate resources from the state for revitalization and economic development in, in these defined um, areas. And we have three in our county uh, that are designated as sustainable communities. And one, Glen Burnie is wholly within region three. And then the, a, a second of these um, sustainable communities, the Odenton Severn community, it, um, comes into region three just a bit. The third, the third one is, uh, the Brooklyn Park Sustainable Community, and that's obviously up in Brooklyn Park. But these, um, these areas, they come with an action plan and an implementation report that's developed for each area. And the action plan for Glen Burnie has very recently, in the last month or two, um, been updated and resubmitted to the state. And um, so I'll stop with that. The, our, our friends from economic development are going to talk a little bit more about some of the programs that target um, properties in the sustainable development community. But at this point, I will turn it over to Jonathan and we'll switch up. Thank, Thank you, Patrick. Patrick. I'm John Boniface uh, with the Anne Arundel Economic Development Corporation. I'm the Director of Research and Program Development. Is that a private company? This is corporate. Uh, we are a quasi-government uh, agency and the kind of the economic development uh, wing of uh, the county. Is this fancy for you? No. I'll stand here and no, I know. There we go. Okay. So the area we're looking at right here is uh, the Region Three, and it has uh, it's home to about thirty two thousand two hundred or eight hundred and twenty seven primary jobs. That's uh, pretty much your full time jobs, not including part time jobs. And this data was all pulled from the U.S. Census Bureau, and this is their on-the-map uh, 
program. It's a little dated. Uh, the last release was uh, 2020. So uh, when we look at the inflows and outflows, that's our like our commuter inflows and outflows, kind of tells us you know how many workers are coming into your region and how many are going out and how many both live and work in your region. So looking at this uh, map right here, we see that we have uh, 28,180 that are coming uh, into but live outside of your, your region. And then we have uh, 47,416 that are actually living in your region but working outside of the area. Um, and then we have 4,647 uh, workers that both live and work in region three. Is that typical across the other regions, that distribution? No, uh, not, <clears throat> oh, right. I mean, there's balanced. nine different regions. So what's that? Look at the county wide. I think it's a little bit more balanced in terms of yes. inflow and outflow. So countywide, we have about 62%, you know, live in, in Anne Arundel County and work outside and about 62% live outside and come to work in Anne Arundel County. Um, but, and we have about 32% that actually are maybe, I'm sorry, 37, 38% that actually live and work in the County. So it's, it's a little different. I mean, you have a, I guess it's, it's not that far off. So why is that yeah. like that? Is it because that air, those areas are primarily residential or is there some other reason for that? Well, it's, I mean, mainly it's, this is where people are living and they're, they're working in the city and they may be working in different parts of the county, but yes, there is a lot of residential in this area, but they, I mean, they also might be working in nearby areas, Annapolis and mm -hmm. uh, different parts that are right outside your region here. Fort Meade is really close. So, um, but in this region, we have a total of 52,063 residents uh, that are employed. Is there a target range you want to stay stay within from an economic sustainability standpoint, like in order for a community? Because it, in, correct me if I'm wrong, those that live within a community and work within a community are more likely to invest within, within that same community, right? I'm not going to invest in a community I work in, but don't live in. Yeah, I mean, you don't want to have, I mean, we are the suburbs of you know, three different cities, you know, Annapolis, Baltimore, Washington. Um, so you do have people that are going to each of those, um, but you don't want to be just a bedroom community. You want to have, you know, people work and live here too. Uh, but I mean, what's that? It impacts you from a tax base though, from both residential taxes and the business taxes. Yes. But I mean, countywide as a whole, we have a lot of jobs. You know, so people are working within the county. We're pulling out one little region to study, you know, that's kind of an arbitrary region that's been developed by planning and zoning to pull it out. So uh, where right here, you know, you have a, a, a bunch of jobs, but for me right next door, I mean, just on the floor, they have over 63,000 jobs. So. Do you expect a change in in those percentages with the population aging, especially in Anne Arundel County? Uh, well, because they won't be employed; they'll be retired. Yeah, I mean, yeah. there are a lot of people retiring. A lot of people growing into it too. So you got more people that's more moving inside of Anne Arundel County and also the children. I'm just saying, just responding to the answer, like there's more people still growing. So even if it's those that retire, it's still, you still got youth that's still standing here and still living or residing. We do. Um, and we do have a lot of older folks that are moving out of the county. Yeah. Uh, they're moving to Florida. They're moving to South Carolina, Delaware. Um, and we have a lot of people moving into the county. In fact, our number one place, our source of people moving into Anne Arundel County uh, from around this area is from Prince George's County. So they're kind of just moving out and moving into our area. So, um, but this goes into kind of where the residents of uh, your region are commuting to. And as you can see, Baltimore City is number one uh, with 12.5% and Glen Burnie, 6.9%. 
And then we have Columbia and Washington, D.C., both uh, just under 5%. Um, and then parole, I mean, going all the way down, people in your region driving down to uh, Annapolis and working there. But this kind of this map kind of shows you the concentrations. And which is pretty typical for an area that's kind of in the center of things. Uh, resident workforce by earnings of the 52,000 residents uh, employed and primary jobs, uh, we have 18.2% are earning $1,250 per month or less. Uh, 242 are earning between 12 51 and uh, $3,333 per month. And, but the vast majority, uh, almost uh, 58%, are earning more than $3,333 per month. And you can kind of see on the chart here how that's changed from 2011 to 2020. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm no. curious if there's an overlay of that to the slide that you showed previously of those who have, who reside in the county and leave the county, what they're, if they're in the higher earning income percentages versus those who come in. To, so are the jobs higher paying that are here in this part of the region or are they lower paying? Uh, in this region, I believe that they're a little bit lower paying jobs. Um, you have a lot of, uh, I mean, you look at the hospitals is a, a, you know, uh, I guess a concentrated area of um, employment, but you also have a lot of retail. So um, a lot of retail jobs are lower paying jobs. So when you go into a store, you know, a, a lot of the restaurants around here, they're not making, you know, the same amounts as uh, lawyers and, um, some of your doctors and some of your others. The job concentrations in this area, where are the jobs from Region 3 located? Um, we find the highest concentrations right here around the hospital, uh, Marley Station Mall, uh, Glen Burnie Town Center, Quarterfield Crossing. If you look at most of these, you'll see that a lot of these are, are retail areas. And where uh, do Region 3 workers commute from? Where are they coming into your region from? Uh, main source is uh, Baltimore City, but also Glen Burnie, uh, Severn, Pasadena, Severna Park, uh, even Dundalk. Uh, but that's where kind of you can see on this map the highest concentrations where they're coming from. And then what kind of jobs are here in your region? Uh, by industry sectors, uh, we look at the number one retail trade. So, uh, you know, those are kind of the lower paying jobs. Um, healthcare and social assistance, that's your hospital jobs. Administration and support, waste management and uh, remediation, that's your admin jobs, uh, facilities, um, uh, just a whole bunch of uh, your waste collection, waste disposal, uh, remediation like surf pro, those type of jobs. Um, professional scientific and uh, technical service says that's your tech jobs, that's your uh, lawyers and uh, people in the, the scientific field, uh, research and development. And then you have accommodation and food services, that's your hotels and your uh, food establishments. What about the airport? Isn't that a big employer? It is, but it's not in Region 3. Right. So it's just out. It just seems like it. Like now there's... The airport has over 10,000 badged employees over there. Mm -hmm. So, and that could be one of the places that people are leaving here to go to, mm -hmm. you know, to work. And uh, the growth of the top uh, industry sectors, uh, we look, looking at the 10 year uh, trend, uh, we see that retail trade has decreased about 4% um, over the 10 years. Uh, health and social services has decreased about 3%. Administration and uh, Support waste management and remediation has gone up 33%, but that main increase with the percentages, they have a lower number of jobs there too. So uh, smaller increases there show up with larger percentages. Uh, professional scientific and technical services increased 19%, and uh, accommodation food services has decreased 8%. Those food services like restaurants? Yes. I'm surprised they decreased because it doesn't seem like it. 
Uh, I mean, it hasn't de decreased that much. If you look at, I mean, here's the line right here, just under 3,000, just a little bit more under 3,000, but because there's a lower number, the uh, percentages are higher. For jobs like <clears throat> professional services, um, jobs that can be done remotely, given that that's the highest or well, second highest increase, do you think like, over the long term, the more remote working becomes the norm, that particular sector is going to continue to, is going to see a downtrend? Uh, well, a lot of these are based on the location of the jobs. So people that are, it's, it's very hard for the Census Bureau to track the remote workers and where they're attributing them to. So we have seen since the pandemic, a huge increase in the number of, uh, or we saw a big spike in the number of remote workers, but then it dropped again the following year. Um, and the data for that is only out to 2022, I think, right now. And, uh, but we have seen, you know, like remote work somewhat. But when you have the remote workers, they are actually helping the local economy in the terms of they're going to, you know, going to lunch. You know, they're doing things nearby. They're running their errands. You are know, those running... workers tracked by where the job is or where they live? I believe the Census Bureau does it by where the job is. I mean, it's, well, for the industries, it's where the job is, but where the workers are and their, their employment and everything, it's by where they're actually from. Then we're, like, we're a major feeder, Region 3, the major feeder, like you said, for DC, right? A lot of the uh, the GSA system, they're, what, two days back on in the office a week now. Um, I they were five days at home, but I guess. <laughs> well, some some agencies- are trying to bring some back. Yeah, some agencies are doing two per pay period, mm -hmm. but I think on average, it's like one or two days oh, wow. in, uh, in the office, the rest is fully remote. And, and that's an economic development point. Uh, the cities have had a real tough time with office space, uh, vacancies there, because of people working from home. Uh, DC is begging people to come back and they're, the federal government's pushing for that. Uh, even the president came out and said, you know, we want these workers back in the office, in our buildings. You know, they own the buildings and nobody's there. They're losing money. I think that that attributes to a lot of the new year and I would call them that region three is severing Odington area as seen in the housing market uh, because people need more space. Well, and one, one of the nice things, I mean, one of your major economic drivers here is this hospital and this hospital is a hard to do remote, you know, work. So, and the same thing with Fort Meade. I mean, that's in near. There are a lot of, sorry, a lot of auxiliary buildings around Fort Meade um, that service the base. With mm -hmm. the expansion of NSA, with the, the addition of what, two buildings, three buildings there? Do they expect that to shift from region three it's into? It's going to be either five or seven buildings wow. total. Wow. They've got two uh, buildings right now. Yeah. And a lot of those are kind of, they're moving things from the older buildings that were built in the you know 60s and, or older, moving them into the, the Morris Center just opened uh, yeah. recently. Absolutely beautiful. They're going to have the new, um, basically your, uh, what's it called? Uh, it's, the, the thing you see in the movies with all the screens, it's a sent Oh, rapid, rapid response uh, units. Something like that, but for, for cyber and everything yeah. else. Yeah. It's just escaping me right now. But, um, but they're moving a lot of that stuff out of the older buildings and in there. And they're trying to bring a lot of people back onto the Ford within the fences of uh, NSA. Yeah, that's why we're about the economic impact of the surrounding areas. Region three straddling that, <clears throat> straddling the base, a lot of those areas are going to be pulled back into the base. And to your point, I, I we were just touring National Business Park um, yeah. a, a few weeks ago, and National Business Park is home to a lot of those defense contractors that have immediate access to the fort that support everything in Fort Meade. And and I asked them, I said, are you guys concerned at all with all the development happening, you know, inside Fort Meade? And and you know, I heard the garrison commander give a speech of probably six months ago that said, you know, the private development needs to be aware that we're pulling a lot back. In, inside the gates and um, they're not concerned about it. I mean, they're still building, you know, they've got three new buildings coming out of the ground right now. They got plans in for, you know, several others with a lot of capacity. Um, they're probably the only people in the state that's building spec office space at this point. So they're not concerned um, about it and they keep building the buildings and, and they keep filling them. So 
That it's a good question though, and it, it is a concern. Um, but so far we haven't seen anybody affected. And for those on Zoom, this, that was Wes, our chief operating officer. Uh, the demographics of the workers, uh, jobs in the region three, uh, almost 50% are held by women. Uh, a little over 50% are uh, held by workers age 30 to 54. And uh, a little over 50% uh, are held by workers earning more than $3,333 per month. Also, we have uh, a little over 35% are held by uh, non-white or two or more race workers. Uh, almost 7% are held by Hispanic or Latino workers. And 20% uh, are held by workers with bachelor's degree or an advanced degree. Uh, now getting into commercial. Let me look at, let me look at that. I was sure. writing down something and I missed this whole slide. Sure. Um, Oh, we send you the presentation too, Rich. I mean, oh, yeah, I, I think yeah. we'll, be, we'll, we'll be posting it, make... it on the pub site and can send it to you as well. And and this is just a brief capture of a lot of this data. Uh, we also have prepared and sent to planning and zoning all these data points and then comparing them also to the entire county as a whole. So you can see how your region compares to the county as a whole and see what percentage. Okay, well, of all the jobs in the county, this is how many are. It's like a relatively low educational level. Well, th this this is a hard one for the Census Bureau to track. Um, if you, uh, I think for by educational attainment, um, there was a large percentage. This entire block right here, uh, they weren't able to. Uh, they weren't available to put in different areas. So that kind of throws it off a little bit. But it's one of the best programs for taking a small area that's in our custom area in this case and be able to look at the data in that area. Now, for commercial properties, uh, commercial real estate market, uh, you have 800. Oh, this is CoStar data, um, which is one of our commercial real estate uh, programs we use. And they've identified 829 commercial properties in this area. And it uh, totals over 16.4 million square feet of property. And if you look at all these, um, the ones in gray are the ones that are occupied. The ones in blue um, are the ones that are vacant. Or have vacancy, a small or, or not totally vacant. Yeah, not totally vacant, but may have a little bit of vacancy. And then if we're looking at retail properties, you can kind of see where the retail properties are located. It's along your major corridors. Um, and that's kind of typical for most of the uh, Anne Arundel County, um, but we have uh, 478 properties in Region 3, uh, which take up about 7.3 million square feet. And the vacancy rate is 9.9% uh, when we pulled this in, uh, I think we pulled this in August. And the to compare that to the county as a whole, the county's for retail is uh, just under 5%. So we have fairly high vacancy rate. For retail, it's... In terms of Anne Arundel County, it's higher than the average. It's about double the average. And I think that that number could be skewed by some of the big box vacancies. Yeah, I'm say um, I think that some of those those larger vacancies probably skew that data a little bit, but it is slightly higher than the county average. And the county as a whole um, is doing better than, you know, than the state and certainly probably on the national average too. If we look at office properties, you have about 202 properties here. With at 2.6 million square feet, uh, the vacancy rate 7.1%, which is in the entire region, a very good vacancy rate. Um, and it's kind of right on par with the entire county as a whole. Industrial properties, there are 83 uh, properties for, taking up 4.1 million square feet. And the vacancy rate there is 3.6%, uh, which is just under what the county is as a whole. And flex properties and flex properties uh, are those with kind of retail or office in the front, but a loading bay in the back and a little warehouse space in the back. Uh, those we have 66 in this area, uh, 2.4 million square feet, and the vacancy rates uh, 6.5 percent, which is kind of on par with the county. 
And now I'm going to turn it over to our uh, Kaylee uh, De La Puente. Hi, uh, Kaylee De La Puente. I'm the Town Center Revitalization Manager with Economic Development. Um, I'm going to start off by uh, talking about the county's commercial revitalization areas. There are 11 revitalization areas in Anne Arundel County. Region 3 has five of them, as I believe you can see on this map here. Uh, and the Commercial revitalization district designation is really meant to stimulate private investment and encourage revitalization in our older commercial corridors. And there's, there's two ways that they do that. One is through regulatory incentives and the other is through financial incentives. In general, the regulatory incentives allow for expanded uses and greater development feasibility in certain zoning districts uh, within a commercial revitalization area. And on the other end, our financial incentives include a property tax credit and access to the Arundel Community Revitalization Loan Fund, which is a, a zero interest loan up to $100,000 for facade improvements. Uh, and it also allows access to architectural services. And um, as an additional note, Applicants are currently eligible for a 25% uh, grant on top of their loan. Economic drivers in Region 3, as you all know, we're here. Um, University of Maryland, Baltimore, Washington Medical Center is one of our um, major economic drivers. 3,198 employees, 314 beds, 18,254 inpatient admissions, and 60,000 672 emergency visits a year. Another major economic driver in Region 3 is the Glen Burnie Town Center. Um, and uh, we're, I'm going to skip forward. We're hoping to better leverage its economic potential. Uh, and one of the ways we did this was through uh, the creation of the Glen Burnie Town Center Revitalization Plan. Um, that we are now in the process of uh, facilitating implementation for. And the revitalization plan has three major overarching categories, um, or overarching major goals, I should say. Uh, the first would be setting the stage for redevelopment. Part of this includes investing in our facades, which we're doing through the ACR loan program that I described. But also included in this goal is, uh, is really um, additionally in, in this goal would, would be uh, conducting a community branding process. And really with that, the hope would be creating a brand that identifies Glen Burnie Town Center and conveys a unique identity that incentivizes people to live, work, and, and visit the town center area. And the branding process could, could include a number of things. It could include things like creating a logo, banners, wayfinding signage, and, and entryway signage for the area. Um, and we're currently in the process of, at the very beginning of the stages of uh, exploring a, a branding process for the town center. Uh, another major goal from the revitalization plan is redeveloping underutilized properties. I think Wes will talk a little bit more about this uh, further on in the presentation, but as, as, a, um, as a highlight for that, um, one property of note would be 7409 B&A Boulevard. This property is county owned and was identified for surplus. Um, an initial RFP was released and awarded. Uh, unfortunately, that has fallen through and the county is now exploring uh, reissuing a new RFP for that property. What does it look like? What does that property look like right now? I think Wes, Wes could talk. Yeah, it was a um, former DPW yeah. storage yard, so they were oh. storing all kinds of trucks oh. and vehicles on it. Um, oh. So it has an office building on, on sort of the, the front of it. It's um, the former sanitation right. mm -hmm. facility. Yeah, part. so it's about um, 
the site as a whole is is actually quite large, but most of it uh, has streams and wetlands and forests and stuff like that. But there's probably about 13 to 15 acres of developable um, of developable site there. So, um, off of BNA Boulevard. Yes, it's right behind. If you know where like that ice house building yeah. is, it's right. It's right behind that. Oh, okay. Okay, um, and another aspect under under this goal is uh, streetscape streetscape improvements. There actually has been a good amount of movement uh, towards this goal over the past few months. Uh, there's been replacement of the the street lights and tree planting along both BNA Boulevard and Crane Highway, and soon to come in in spring 2024, there'll be the addition of a pedestrian crosswalk at the parking garage. Uh, across BNA, BNA Boulevard. And lastly, um, another goal is organizing for long-term success. And basically that just means creating a, a more sustainable long-term management structure for the town center that incorporates our, our stakeholders and partners in the area. Okay. I, I would point out too, if I can interrupt real quick, the, this master plan is um, is in your shared drive. If you wanna take a deeper dive, it's really got some really great graphics and a lot more information if you're interested in taking a deeper look. The property that we were talking about is at the very top of that, that slide there. Yeah, if this is, I apologize. I wanted to reverse the slides, but this is a map of uh, what is considered Glen Burnie Town Center in the revitalization plan. Um, so you can see here the entryway points at the, the big blue circles, I believe, are the major uh, gateways. And then those three little circle areas are transitions to the town center area um, where there's opportunities to better identify your entry into the town center. Um, and the list here are, are basically um, some, some broader consideration, considerations and additional goals for the town center. Um, a lot of them have been kind of talked about previously, but I also wanted to highlight on this list, revitalizing the town center plaza and activating uh, the, the town center plaza with more activity, uh, enhancing the carnival grounds, coordinating with heritage at town center to improve Glen Square and improving the, the public parking garage. Is there any study of what kinds of commercial um, uh, commercial commercial properties would be um, more exciting and useful to the residents than what is, you know, because we do have a lot of vacant commercial space. And I imagine there's some in that area. I mean, I can think of a few. And uh, it just seems like there could be a more targeted um, uh, effort to bring in businesses that people would actually be attracted to. So as part of the revitalization plan, there was a market analysis that looks at um, what the market can su currently support um, and if there are any gaps and opportunities with what businesses are there. Mm -hmm. And it definitely did identify um, some opportunity, uh, opportunity business types um, for that the town center would be, would be ripe for. Um, I'm a little around. rusty. Yeah. I spent a lot of time with it, but I don't want to start guessing. But it, it's all there um, in the in the revitalization plan. I feel like I don't want to say the wrong starting. Yeah, I was just going to say, Kaylee and I anecdotally joke all the time about how you know we have meetings. We're Kaylee has an office in the town center, um, and and we are constantly having meetings um, there. And we struggle to find a good place to go get just a cup of coffee. So. Um, that's definitely on the list of something that's needed uh, in the Glen Burnie Town Center. Yes. Um, I know other people have have their their wants and things like that. Um, but you know, when businesses look to locate in places like that, you know, they look at demographics, they look at foot traffic. You know, what's going to drive their sales? So it's a little bit of the chicken and the egg thing. Like the the business isn't going to come there without the foot traffic, and people aren't going to come there without the good business. So you know, the plan is to sort of implement a lot of um, revitalization in the town center to make things, you know, nicer, to bring people there. Um, the benefit of the town center is we, we do have a lot of foot traffic with the community college building right there, um, with the court right down the street. So it does have sort of captured that foot traffic, which is great. 
Um, so we just need to kind of capitalize that on that and, and attract those businesses to, to take advantage of the of the foot traffic. Would you mind passing the lollipops down this way? <laughs> <laughs> Let's go back to your picture diagram again. The letter, uh, which one? the letter Oops. H yeah. on it um, for the RFP process for the mixed use. Yeah. Is that yeah. that's yeah. the thirteen to fifteen acres? Yes. Yeah. How many residential properties can you can like how how high can we go if we were doing mixed use, and would we also create some market rate housing in there, um, or is it yeah, no. I mean, we'd have to see what what the proposals look like. I mean, I think the idea is to have sort of a mix of of um, housing types and and also a mix of commercial as well, um, and and something that would be good for the community. Is there a restriction on how high we can go? Oh with yeah, the there's certain restrictions. And yeah, and I'll go. Offhand, I don't know what that would be. It would depend on the zoning and such. We can get that answer for you and. Um, share that back out but it could be that one of the recommendations that that as a group you want to make is maybe there's an overlay or something needed for the Glen Burnie area or for certain you know properties in this area that allow for additional density and mix of uses beyond what's currently it's available. also important to note too that that site is located you can see on the map right next to that residential neighborhood of single family houses mm -hmm. right so I think whatever goes there um you know in the planning process, we're going to be very mindful of, you know, not having that neighborhood, that established single family neighborhood, and then you cross the street and you have a 10 story uh, multifamily project, right? There's going to be some some buffer and there's going to be some um, transition. There are such great examples out there of mixed use community or mixed use communities done well with tunnels and, you know, yes. apartment dwelling and all that, but you got to get the right retail. And yes. Um, just curious how many we can fit. I read a really um I was I was reading Dan Butner's book about the blue zones and the Singapore for it's also in the Netflix series if you want to see it, but in Singapore they um provide for older people by having this multi-story building with a sandwich idea and they have one floor might be commercial, one is like gathering space, and at the top would be the residences. So, and then towards the bottom might be an exercise or green area. So they provide for all of the seniors' needs within that layered building. I was fascinated, works really well. Mm -hmm. But they built up, you know, cause they have limited land space in Singapore, but they wanted to accommodate their older people and keep them healthy and happy. Well, the, Over the I believe the intention would be mixed use for that. It would be mixed use and probably mixed income as well. Again, so there's some starting conceptually, yeah. but you know, we have to wait and see what the proposals look like, but that's sort of the goal and the idea of, of what to do there. Okay, this is, this is you. Okay. Unless anyone has any more questions on my slides. No, I do have a question. Sure. Um, so the I, I was seeing the um the carnival property. I mean, like basically it sits there all the time. Like, I mean, it's not we're not doing anything and the swings are right there. I'm just saying, do y'all have an idea of what could be done other than just sitting there until the carnival come every year? Because literally, I really feel like it's a it's, it's just not being used to the productivity that it could be. And I mean, like, of course, a lot of people try to access it, but it's limited sometimes. Like people are not able to access that space because of what it's used for. So I wanna know, um, like, how can people more, get more accessible to that space and what y'all plan on doing with that space other than just the car? So that property is owned by our good friends at the Glen Burnie Improvement Association. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that is a conversation um, that we're, we're having with them um, with with just that that question. What are what are the opportunities um, for additional use, better, more continued public use for that space? Um, I know there, there's a little a little playground on that side yeah, that could, awesome. could use some love. Yeah. Um, and you know, we did. I'm sorry. I think I accidentally kicked out a, one of our slides here. I'm realizing um, we did get. 
uh, economic development got funding from the state of Maryland, um, a community legacy grant, 250,000 to work on the implementation of the Glen Burnie Town Center Revitalization Plan. Right. So this is this is an active process and we're, you know, we do we do have some funding to kick off implementation of this, but we're we're still looking for additional resources too. Okay. All right. So I do got like two more questions. So okay. <laughs> so in the I guess if, if there are recommendations for things that the community would like to see at that that space. I don't think that's outside of the purview of recommendations from this group. So okay. So I also want to do like small businesses thought process. Like when people have small business, because you're talking about the town center, mm -hmm. and I know that it is so many people um researching the people that do have small business that do want to be able to use that space because of course I'm saying from the perspective of a small business person, I'm basically saying that I'm trying to get it together because I was thinking about it and then I lost the thought. Sorry, y'all. So what I basically do is the opportunity for small businesses to move in the area or to be able to use or the people that in, that's inside in Orange County or Region 3 per se or wherever to be able to use that space and then being, having, being able to have incentives to go along with those small businesses that maybe can revitalize that community and have people come in and out. Because if you have people that are from this community and they see that they have a sustainable business. Is this something that y'all can look into or develop a plan where small businesses can get involved and be able to be a part of um, revitalizing the, the town center? So you're Sorry. Not, you're not talking about the carnival area now. You're talking in general about the town center. I'm moving from the carnival to the town center. Resources to support yes. businesses moving to. Yes, the town center. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Well, currently in, in our, we, we have a couple different financial loan programs. Um, one covers uh, mostly exterior facade improvements. And then we have our, our Vault ULT loan program, which covers, can you give me the list of any, any general like, purpose? So acquiring a building, yeah. um, build out inside of the building. Um, uh, it could be working capital, it could be buying equipment. It's the name really any, yes, any name that long. Yes, please. Uh, Volt V O L T, and I, I could send you some information on it after this. Okay, I appreciate it. Uh, but we have a lot of resources. I mean, that's why we exist um, is to help small businesses. So if you know of any small businesses that are looking for assistance, um, especially in the town center, um, you certainly put them to Kaylee. What about like um, incubator spaces for whether um, spaces that would allow um small businesses with like a lower barrier of entry to sustain itself whether it's like mm -hmm. in the town center itself or in some of the other developments that we're thinking building the space out as part of the as part of the design for small businesses to come inhabit so we used to run an incubator once upon a time um it was actually housed in odenton um we no longer do it just wasn't a sustainable model because of we had a lot of overhead with rent and things like that and um and supporting those businesses. So we're sort of out of the incubator market. That said, there are some um, private incubators. There's a, there's one in Annapolis that's really good at not only just providing the space, but also providing a lot of resources and mentorship and access to capital and things like that. Um, and then, you know, if you don't need all that, if you just need sort of like small professional offices, there's several throughout the county that, that provide that. I'm just wondering with the, with, with the rise of small businesses that are, primarily or partly partially remote, the services that your office can provide to those businesses um, that can't get to an endless or can't get to. Yeah, there's, there are a few places that like if you're a, a home-based business, but you know, you're meeting with a client and you want to have like a nice boardroom or a conference room to meet them in. There are places throughout the county that, that have that service. You can just kind of pay by the hour. And I, I think you were talking about incubator in a little bit of a different direction, but we do have um, our inclusive ventures program, which is a support incubator, not a place-based incubator, but a skills-based incubator was program yeah. That's for was small and minority owned businesses. And that has been a, a really great way for us to connect with additional small, small businesses in the County and then, for instance, if they're a good fit for some space in the town center, um, for, I, I brought some of our IVP grads to the tree lighting last 
week, I think. Um, so that's kind of one way we're trying to support a filter of small businesses to the town center. So if I want to raise some chickens to somehow I could have an incubator. <laughs> We have a new ag person that can help you yeah. with that. Yeah, okay, great. <laughs> also, just to mention that the financial programs from AATC um, are in um, the briefing paper, the accounting briefing paper, if you want to see more. Okay. They're spelled out on our website as well. AEVC.org. Yep. And we're happy to talk to any small business that may or may not, you know. One other question. Do you all do do um anything with the vacant properties that are in Anne Arundel County or is that owned and managed by a different office? Like the vacant um commercial properties, I'm thinking like 175 is a bunch of they're county owned? Uh, yes, uh, county owned. They're not. I'm, I mean, I mean, I'm just saying, if you're talking like from which part, like the beginning of... Um, you're talking about on 175 across from Fort Meade, the vacant properties over there? Well, those aren't vacant. Those no, are yeah. owned by, from my understanding, those aren't, they're vacant, but they're owned, but they're, they're, they're private. They're private. Yeah, they're private, county. yeah. But there are some properties further down 175, like right where they just built Jessup and they're building the new um, Royal Farms. There, there's yeah. at least one or two properties down there that are vacant. I don't know whether that fell under your area or is different. But they're owned by the county. Yeah, the the property across from the highs, um, right, just beyond where they're building the Royal Farms. Mm -hmm. That's a county owned property. Oh, uh, uh, I knew the properties you're talking about. Yeah, um, I know across the, across the street from it is not that that's owned by. Can't think of the name of the family that owns that. Uh, it's a historical site. Uh, we we don't get involved. That's uh, Central Services. So it's the most in managing that property, but I think that those are slated for um, future development and road widening and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, at this point, I wanted to kind of transition us into some group discussion about a couple of opportunity sites. But one thing, Jason, do you feel like we ought to take a quick five minute? I was going to say, kind of blew through our I think it might be a good <laughs> idea. Yeah. We're all running a little bit behind, though. So if we could literally do three, four minutes and then get back together and um, and then we'll discuss. So, yep. So, four minutes. <laughs> back. Four, four minutes. Okay. 724. Sure, I know, right? <laughs> Whatever.
Yeah. As I mentioned yeah. before, yeah. I kind of the outset of this, um, of tonight's meeting, we've heard a lot from our community members about um, interest in redevelopment of our, you know, particularly aging commercial sites and that sort of thing. Marley Station Mall keeps coming up in a lot of um, a lot of these discussions. I, so we wanted to kind of create some space to talk for about maybe 10, 15 minutes about a couple of key sites in in the region, Marley Station Mall being one that's within the region, and then a couple that are just outside of the region but adjacent and have big impacts for the region. So um, we, you know, th these sites, I, I'll just kind of set the stage and just go on record. These are public, these are private sites. And so there's always that to, um, to think about. We're gonna be reaching out to the various property owners of these sites and, and talking to them about their future plans. But we do wanna discuss and hear from you in terms of what do you think would be appropriate and ideal for, for these sites? Um, how, how, how could, we think about the future of some of these sites in a way that's appropriate for the context where they are and, and, and have positive impacts as opposed to negative impacts on the areas around them. So we wanna hear from you tonight and maybe start to craft some initial strategies um, that we can then put out to the public and get you know, feedback from the public as well. Um, and we also wanna think about steps that the county can take to, to really promote redevelopment, but, um, you know, these plans are gonna have just ge very general recommendations in terms of, of redevelopment. Um, yeah, we, we just wanna think about what we can include in terms of recommended actions for, for our county agencies, planning and zoning, but also EDC, and, um, and help us understand what it is that the community wants to see. So we wanna focus on three sites in particular, one being Marley Station Mall, and you'll you see it labeled in the bottom there. That is within one of the commercial revitalization areas that Kaylee was talking about. And then I want us to, to spend about 10, 15 minutes talking about Marley Station Mall. Then I want us to move to Cromwell, the Cromwell Field area, which is just barely outside of region three, but I think it impacts and, and, and can really talk to um, the Glen Burnie Town Center as well. And then I wanna move over to the Marley Neck area and talk about Brandon Shorts. Very briefly, we don't have a whole lot of information there, but um, I wanna to touch on that and maybe give some space for that. So let's talk briefly. Let's start with um, this Marley Station area. And Wes, I'm gonna call on you to kind of help give some, some background and, and help give us Kind of a reality check, I guess, of what can be done and can't be done on some of these sites. But it, if I can kind of start with Plan 2040, um, the general development plan placed this this mall area in. Uh, this is a really blurry slide, and I'm not sure why. But um, this placed it in what's called the critical corridor development policy area, and that's a policy area that calls for. It, it, it's it's aligned on existing and developed areas along major roads, um, generally regional scale and auto-oriented commercial areas um, and congested arteries. And it, areas within the critical corridor, they tend to be the economic center of a community. And Plan 2040 calls for investments to improve safety and mobility for all modes. So bike, ped, transit, as well as cars and a stronger mix of uses in a manner that preserves um, adjacent neighborhoods. Um, and so in the graphic that you see here, it kind of shows some of the development patterns around the, around the mall. Um, there's a walk score, if you're familiar with walk scoring, um, it's, it's a score of zero to 100 of how walkable an area is. This one gets a 48, so most, er most errands um, in this area require you to get into a car. Um, single family detached neighborhoods around traditional suburban pattern, a lot of cul-de-sacs and lack of connectivity in the neighborhoods around, around here. Um, transit along Route 2, Route 100. I don't know if you have any other kind of background information that you want to share about this, this particular site. Yeah, I mean- I have a couple of other slides. Well, I have, I have, I could probably talk for three hours about the background of this particular site. We've been working on it so long. Um, but I think just to understand sort of where the mall is today, um, it was 
purchased maybe a year and a half, two years ago. It's been two years already. Uh, it was purchased by um, a new a new owner uh, that has come in and. Frankly, you know, this ownership group doesn't have a great reputation for um, reinvesting in their properties and, you know, for the long term. Um, I think that this is, an, this is an out of town ownership that bought it without seeing it and really without knowing the dynamics of, of the mall and of the area. Um, I heard they're from New York. Is that right? Yeah, they're based out of New York. That's right. Um, with that said, you know, their original plan was to come in here and not redevelop the property, rather um, try to retenant the property as much as they can, um, you know, put some more retailers in there and, you know, try to try to increase their their revenue. So obviously it's it's challenged. Um, I think that the community perception of the mall is that it's a dead mall, it's a failing mall, there's nothing in there, nobody goes there. We'd love to see something happen there. Um, I do want to mention too, especially to this group, that you know I've been taking meetings with um, people interested in acquiring this mall and redeveloping this mall probably for over a decade now, and I've probably met with you know easily a dozen groups that have been interested um, in in redeveloping this mall. And I, I do want to mention that I I start off every one of my meetings before they give any kind of presentation of plans of what they want to do by saying that the Ann site is not to be touched. You're not allowed to do anything with that. It has to remain. <laughs> and everybody's very, very and and the and and the yeah, it can't be such a <laughs> That's a legacy, right? Legacy. So everybody's very understanding of that. But mm -hmm. but that's sort of where we are today. Um, you know, new owners that have had it for a couple of years now, um, you know, through the grapevine, I've heard that they've <clears throat> been interested in possibly, you know, joint venturing with a with a private developer, maybe looking at redeveloping it, but you know. Before we get into some feedback of you know, what this group would be interested in seeing there, I, I do want to make you guys aware of sort of the challenges with this site. Um, the biggest one, I think, is the multiple ownerships and the, the control that um, people have over this. So um, this Boscov site right here, this is actually a separate owner than the rest of the mall. And this owner has been typically difficult to, to deal with and doesn't play along with anybody who's owned this site. Um, so it's been tough to get them to, to work together and agree on anything. So when you're talking about the entirety of this site, it's gonna to be tough with different ownership here. Um, the other challenge is these big box retailers also control that site as well. So if somebody were to come in and say, you know, we're gonna buy this property and we're gonna redevelop it, and these big box retailers know about it, you can essentially hold them hostage and say, well, you're gonna pay me a lot of money we're also not going anywhere. And, and we've seen that for a couple of groups that have come in interested in redeveloping it, um, you know, crazy, crazy uh, demands for what they want to be picking. So honestly, that's the biggest obstacle, I think. Um, you know, the benefits of this site, as Patrick mentioned, you have great access to these major highways, these major corridors. Um, you have all of this impervious surface, which is, you know, with all the new regulations and forest conservation and stuff like that these days, you know, that that existing impervious surface is super valuable um, from a development standpoint. Um, you also have the BNA trail that has connectivity here as well. Um, so there's a lot of benefits. I think the biggest benefit of this site is that, I'm, we'll hear from you in a second, but I think that the community wants to see this site be successful. And I also think that the county wants to see the site be successful. So I think everybody's once the same thing. Um, it's just the challenges of the multiple different ownerships. But I, I'd be curious to what your guys' thoughts are on the mall and what you know what could be. We did have a, another slide on here. This is from um, a, a proposal um, to redevelop a mall site and actually out in Buffalo, New York. Sometimes it's sometimes it's kind of hard to envision beyond what's already on a site, but um, Sometimes a graphic like this can kind of help get um, get us thinking in ways, and you can kind of see different phases where certain portions of that mall are proposed to be preserved, while other parts are redeveloped in different phases. So there are there are opportunities potentially um, to think about in in that regard. Um, so can we start? Can we spend a few minutes talking about? I'm going to go back to 
one of our other slides on Marley Station about what would be like a, a realistic vision in your mind for this site and what would you know help enhance some of the surrounding neighborhoods. And Delaware is going to actually take notes on an old school um, flip chart. <laughs> and I yeah. think, um, well, kind of two angles. One is we have a, a very heavy Hispanic population in that in the Glen Burnie area, and I'm wondering if we could have businesses and activity that would um, attract them and maybe services too. And I'm thinking, what if we had a really great dance ballroom where there could be a community lessons and um, and dances as kind of like community bonding thing, but I'm sure the Hispanic community in particular would uh, appreciate that. <clears throat> we could also have a nice space where you could book for quinceaneras, you know, the 15 year old uh, coming out parties and weddings and I mean, um, special events that where people want to rent a very nice place, but and it has to be large for a large number of people. So La Fontaine Blue right down the street from that was recently purchased um, and it was purchased by a Hispanic business owner oh, who, great. who uh, Really, it's funny you say all this, that wants to focus on kids and euros and um, having events like that there. So, um, La Fuente Azul. Sure. I'm just ready to write Quintanilla and we're going to just have a Go ahead. So, um, I do like the mixed use thought process for that area. Um, mm -hmm. Being able to have stores and then also have a sustainable residence there and um again I'm, I'm i'm for recreation so anything that can build parks because this sentence it's it, it also around um the bike trail so it's like everything around the bike trail you want to make sure it's something that is walkable and everybody can be able to it's accessible to a lot of people um the other thing is that uh Again, I start with small businesses, things that people that can develop, because you want people just to develop the area. So putting those people inside of that area would definitely work. I don't see no real use for the building as it exists now because I mean, like it's no but no stores in there. I still go there though. I like I like walking it. So, but it's nothing, and it's so much parking lot space that they do need more space, even if they can divide it and say that one person or one owner can have this portion or have that portion and develop that way. But that's the only way I look at it. Just so one of the things that you mentioned was utilizing that uh, the the BNA trail, yes, that asset that comes through here. There was a proposal one that was a group that uh, that looked at this once upon a time and was interested in, in redeveloping it. But they, their plan was to use this BNA trail and have like a big like community space like right off of it, so you yes. could sort of walk there or bike there. And it was like a you know, like a pavilion, like a, you know, place for community gatherings and, and concerts and stuff like that. I think you have like a beer garden there. Um, but it was, they really wanted to kind of take advantage of, of having that, that trail and access to that trail. I thought was, a, I thought that was, that was a good idea. Yeah. Because a I, component. Yeah. obviously the rest of it, and I think it's important to, you know, when we talk about, again, we are talking about private, privately owned property right. Right, that, that we don't control. Um, I think it's important for everybody to, to understand that a property like this, right? If, if we're talking about a redevelopment, um, it's gonna be a multi, multi, multi-million dollar project. Um, so with, with that said, it's gotta be a, something that's gonna be able to generate- Sustainable, right? something sustainable, yeah. yeah. Right, we're, we're not gonna you know, see this be redeveloped into like a public park, right? Because right. how do you, get your revenue back from exactly, that. Right, exactly. Okay, I, and I just want to, you know, put that out there that anything that happens here is going to have to sort of be revenue generating. Obviously, we want great things mm -hmm. for the community. Right. We would love to have some community space, stuff like that. But it's got to be a mix of uses, I think, and probably a balance that, that gets that revenue for whatever de developer goes it's into this right project there. like that, that puts mm -hmm. up the multi, multi, hundreds of millions of dollars to do this. Right. Um, you know, but also has some community benefit as well. I just want to put that out there because I think a lot of times, especially community groups kind of have these expectations of, you know, let's let's do this concept or whatever, but don't look at, you know, the money that it takes to, to right to develop it. Yes, absolutely. So um, I, I know it's outside of and I'm kind of thinking um, Laurel Mall that used to be 
was an example of a mall that died for years. But yeah, then, we were just talking about that today. And they, they rebuilt that whole area, and now it's a place where people will go. Mm -hmm. All right. So maybe a case study? That could be a really good, because I remember when the lower mall was dying. I don't know, yeah. you have to think. It used to be hopping, and then it was dead, <laughs> and now it's a town center. Yeah. But, but the concept of, of regional shopping malls everywhere right. has, yeah. has drastically changed. Um, you know, it was this you know with this 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 concept of a mall where you have the the big box you have the four big box stores and that's going to be your your anchor tenants and that's going to drive the traffic that that model's no longer right that was changing right. pre-covid and then when covid happened that trend totally accelerated into that's that's not going to happen again that's not the model so what what that's transitioning to with these shopping mall shopping centers are transitioning to are instead of the big box stores being the anchor tenants of being the driver of of traffic it's more mixed use. It's, mm -hmm. it's residential, right? It's it's multifamily. Um, it's uh, what I kind of call like experiential retail, mm -hmm. right? Stuff that you can't get by sitting in front of a, a computer that you have to actually physically go there. So I mean, looking at a, like a run bill is a good example of that that was probably ahead of their time in terms of having these experiential retail. So medical times, right? They've got the casino now, um, all these other concepts, restaurants, grocery stores, all these other types of concepts that... Um, that are going to be the drivers of traffic, not these big box retailer stores. Because frankly, that model, you have this huge, you know, 60,000 square feet of retail space, which is expensive. Um, why have that when you most of your customers just ordering stuff online now anyways? Yeah. So it's it's been a huge shift. And, you know, whatever happens is going to be shifting away from this model for sure. Okay, this summer was like a, a landmark summer for my husband and I, because <clears throat> the smoke the intermittent scattered thunderstorms, the excessive heat, we just couldn't get out. We used to use the trail a lot, um, but it, it, the summer weather made it almost impossible to dodge around all these different things. And I think because climate change is encroaching on us, there's gonna be a, a bigger need for indoor recreation opportunities. And you can make money off of indoor recreation opportunities. People wanna move around, so what my husband and I did, we just joined LA Fitness and we're like thrilled to death because we don't have to depend on the weather or the air quality in order to move around. So I'm thinking, especially when you have large spaces, which you often need for recreation, um, a variety of recreation um, <clears throat> businesses within Marley Station Mall, I think that's gonna come in the future. There's gonna be a drive for people looking for somewhere, I mean, People already walk around Marley Mall, but that's like what seniors tend to do. But there, we need more kinds of recreational opportunities indoors. So a couple, couple of things. One, you're you're spot on. There's definitely a need for indoor recreation space in the county, um, indoor sporting sports fields and things like that. There's a there's a handful of them, and they print money um, yeah. because they're in such such high demand. So. A super high demand for that. You mentioned sort of the, the gym. Say what you want about the state of Marley Station and, and the, the the retailers that are in there. One thing that does do really well in that mall currently is the Golden's Gym. Um, they they do super well. Um, they they just reinvested a bunch of money into that, um, and that does super well. So obviously that market it would support something like that. There might be other kinds of recreation. Yeah. So I was going to say uh, there was. I told you I've met with dozens of. Uh, people that have expressed interest in redeveloping this over the years. Um, there was one concept that that um, that did turn a portion of the property into indoor recreation fields, indoor sports uh, fields, uh, you know, indoor soccer fields, indoor lacrosse fields, um, indoor basketball courts, things like that. So, you know, I think something like that would do well. Mm -hmm, I do. I do too. I think there'd be a lot of people looking for something like that. And for different age groups. Yep. I mean, there's going to be the youth, but there's going to be a lot of seniors that need to move around. It goes back to your blue zone. Yeah. And I do have like an all set because I know Anne County yeah, Community College is the uh, the area. I'm just saying like a small hub right there, like they have at Rundle Mills, where they have like a little um, a building over there. Yeah. So that could be something that could be there because even though you have that town center that's still accessible to people that's not going all the way down to Arnold and they can still come that way. That's, that's something right. to avoid. That's a really good idea. Um, putting a regional higher education center there. Yeah. Like there's only, yeah. Impact only has what, six of them. 
and Arundel Mills is too small to be that one building is 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 isn't big and big enough. If if they move that and put that in that space, they could expand the regional higher education center a lot more and have Anne Arundel County Community College with AACC, which is the anchor mm -hmm. or the one over at Arundel Mills, have more space and be able to bring in more schools. Like the university so clubs, yeah, I yes. see that. Yeah. So yes, University of Shady Grove is a perfect example. University of Shady Grove started off as a small regional higher education center, and they grew with um the with, with Maryland the, Montgomery Yes, College, with the partnership with Maryland, Hopkins, they, like, they grew their biodiversity fields, yeah. and that's why that's such a booming area. That space could be used, like AACC would move their regional higher education center, would at least consider it to there because it's one closer to their campus. They have a bigger footprint mm -hmm. and parking is an issue over at Arundel Mills now anyway. Yeah. And all the schools will come over there because I used to manage one of the regional education centers down in um, Southern Maryland. And it was always a hassle having classes over at AACC Arundel Mills. Question for the, the group um, thinking about this. Last time we were together, we talked a lot about kind of the trail, but then also access to healthy foods. Um, is this an opportunity for us, you know, for that indoor experience type of thing to have cooking demonstrations, but have different types of almost like an indoor farmer's market and like, or even the the markets down in Baltimore City yeah. are fabulous, yes. um, you, go out, yeah. you know, and to do kind of that market concept where you could go and go to the butcher and get your three inch whatever. So yes. um, have some, you know, is that an opportunity to have would that fit in kind of mixed well, juice, mixed, you know, and you know, having the entertainment hubs as well as food and nutrition? I think that the uh, the medical field of the hospital here, they're looking to expand. And being so close, Marley Station would be a perfect fit for them. And you could also do some um, housing there. So you have an opportunity to live and have medical uh, access right there on the same site without leaving. And you have, you already had transportation because there is a bus route there. You get, and it, it, it has availability of, of, of a car, car parking. The other thing is now the regional higher education that you were talking about. One of the things when I was working, um, Montgomery College had, had a program well, they train auto technicians, mm -hmm. and what's about to happen in the auto world is going to be require a lot of training to be retraining to be done because the current technicians can't work on electric cars, mm -hmm. and that's where we're headed. In the state of Maryland, by 2030, there'll be 60% of cars sold will be electric. Now, that's a lot of cars to maintain, so they have to be maintained. There's already a space there at Mall Station Mall because when Sears was there, they already had an auto garage there. So there's no major change that will have to be done in the regional higher education center. We'll probably look to go to a place like that because everything they have is they would need is already there. Very interesting concept because you can do industrial um, industrial retraining in that space. Mm -hmm. Then it's bringing more people to the um to the area. You essentially, do what to Shade Grove did in the biofield, mm -hmm. right yeah. here for the industrial field. You could use it for the biofield too. I mean, yeah. there's the the number of surgical techs, radiological techs, the these entry level technical yeah. positions. Almost yeah. all of the community colleges um, cease their programs. Yeah, we're doing a lot of on site trainings um, through the but but you need somebody to do the first years of education. Yeah, um, so it's creating those educational. Was it the facilities the reason why they they cease the programs or the trainers? Oh. Oh. Those that's what those regional education centers are hubs to bring in smaller resources from local colleges into one place for the community to, to access. Is there opportunity to have gardens on top of the roofs? Have the building there. That's a green view too. Green rooftops. Even if it's impervious surface, if there's still the rooftop. You could do that. Sucks. 
So it sounds like people would be in support of some sort of a redevelopment of this site, probably sure. some sort of yeah. a mixed use type of concept where you have some residential, you have some some um, some commercial retail, yeah. um, you know, maybe an, even some you know uh, you know education component to it as well. You know, it'd be great if a recommendation that comes out of this committee is you know some sort of support for a for a mixed use redevelopment of the, of this site. And I'm kind of hearing some amenities too potentially with that with that redevelopment. And the well. nice thing about this site is it's large enough that it can do all of those things. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And talking about all that impervious parking, I mean, the redevelopment yeah. really could help bring the stormwater standards From up. environmental it. perspective, it would, any, any, uh, anything that happens here will be a, a dramatic increase yeah. from a stormwater management perspective. What do you think from the property owner's perspective is the biggest hindrance to like, why aren't they already seeking some of this out? Like, why is it more profitable or, or desirable for, at this point for them to just get new tenants and not be already proactively looking at redevelopment? Or well, have they expressed any interest? Is they have like They have more recently. I mean, their model is they acquire shut them off like this, and, they, and that's their model. They try to retenant it. They put minimal money into it. They kind of take it to the end of its useful life, and then they either... Um, Redevelop it or sell it somebody to redevelop it. That's just sort of their model. And again, they they bought this without really seeing it or certainly uh, understanding the dynamics of it. So they didn't come in with a vision for no, definitely not. They definitely didn't come up with a vision for redevelopment. I think yeah. now they're starting to maybe see that that might be a more viable option. Um, so you know, we'll see. D electric car charging stations. I think we see any new development project or redevelopment project. I think that we'll see um, incorporate car driving stations. But I mean, they've got so many areas of the parking lot, and they they could have like three or four of those. Yeah, I mean, most new development projects these days will will incorporate charging stations. Um, it's a great way. But to, this is, would that be considered a new redevelopment project? I think it'll just be a part of it. I mean, it's not mm -hmm. going to be specifically around car charging stations, but I think it'll certainly be part of it. Mm -hmm. Private owners have to agree to the redevelopment, or is it something that the county can kind of like, I don't say force their hand or highly encourage? Like, I don't have enough background information on this, but like, is it kind of a like beating a dead horse if the owners are kind of like, we don't want to do anything, and then it's just like a whole another ten years of. Yeah. So that's a that's a good question, um, and I think one one of the questions was what uh, that was the question that you asked was you know, why not? What's the biggest obstacle? Um, I, my opinion is the biggest obstacle is the the multiple ownerships and the big box stores controlling, having control over their spaces and basically kind of holding hostage. Um, your question about is there anything that the county can do to kind of force people's hands? Um, you know, there is eminent domain. The county's not going to do that for a private a, a private uh, owned uh, property like this, um, there is there is that tool, but I don't think it would be utilized. I can't imagine that. Are there adjacencies that we could uh, either utilize for those big boxes yeah. or spaces within this campus environment that we could say, look, we'll, we'll give you a spot where footage will look like this. You know, you're you're part of the future plan. Um, I don't think the big boxes would be interested in that. Honestly, it's more profitable. I mean, half of them are empty. Yeah, I mean, you know what I mean? So, I mean, there's more profit in holding out and getting getting bought out of their lease than it is to, you know, move somewhere else. Since it's called for. Marley Station, we should send Jacob Marley to each of those owners <laughs> and get them to change their hearts. Which property zoned? C3. 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 I need the chart for the people that don't know the zones offhand. Mm -hmm. Commercial general. Thank you. Because yeah. it's across the yeah, C3 <laughs> is our general um general commercial. It does tend to be our big box types of uses. How long are the leases? Too long. How long? <laughs> <laughs> Too long How much time is left? A long time. Yeah. Mm. Um yeah. So any solution would have to be able to incorporate the big boxes. They'd have to. They'd have to um, probably buy them out. 
to be able to buy them out. And there are groups, look, there's groups out there that do this all the time, right? That that take centers like this and they are used to dealing with retailers, used to dealing with existing leases and used to sort of, you know, negotiating deals to, to get them out. Um, so it, it's not impossible, but it is the biggest obstacle in, in my mind. You have to make the land worth more. The highest and best use of the land has to be made. And that is a recommendation by possibly us that it outpaces what the mall is there for. So if you increase the value of the land for a new purchaser or a bigger group to come in, mm -hmm. then the mall may have the the group has the money to buy out the big boxes and then that's where the density, the overlays and all that come in for that piece of land. And to to that point, you know, I, I think a great again, I don't want to steer this group, but it would be great to have some sort of a recommendation that comes out of this this committee that you know we're talking about the zoning is this is it existing zoning and when i talk about the this property you know i always say and i give the disclaimer that like i'm not speaking on behalf of the county or this is just my personal opinion i think that if we are talking about a large-scale redevelopment of this site um and turning it into a great mixed-use development like like what they did at, at the laurel mall like what like an annapolis town center that type of concept it's going to require its own zoning overlay yeah, like to, to be able to, yeah, like a wall chapel, right? It's going to have to have its own zoning overlay to be able to get the density mm -hmm. that's required. Again, this goes back to somebody's going to come in and spend hundreds of millions the of dollars to do this, right? Yeah. So, you know, to get the density that's required to get the return on their investment mm -hmm. on the on the residential side. Can you explain um, what you mean by that its own zoning overlay? And I know we're over time. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> Significantly. <laughs> It's okay. I think Marley's the one we wanted to really focus on more so than the other ones. But, um, a, a zoning overlay would basically be um, a map that designates a specific area that has its own sort of zoning um, uh, code to it, basically. So like Pearl Town Center mm -hmm. is a great example of, of that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Wall Chapel Town Center is a good example of that. That has its own zoning overlay, that has its own standards, that has its own... Um, so uh, take Wall Chapel, there was an existing zoning, let's say it was C3. Yeah. Then someone came in and said, we want to make it more complex and be able to, to do more. So, so that would give you the ability to do uh, more dense um, residential. It would give you the ability to maybe sometimes forego APF in some cases. It would give you some other incentives that would offset that high cost of the redevelopment that would incentivize somebody to come in and actually do something like that. Yeah, and the Glen Burnie Sustainable Community Overlay does apply to this site as well, and that does have some additional allowances um, that come with that, but I think we need more. Yeah, I, I, this, I would, we're into my personal opinion now. But clearly, yeah. <laughs> well, I think we have some good models for it and of, of layouts that we could use to reference, and I don't know whether this committee needs to recommend the particular details of it or just a zone in general of it. yeah but i think if there are developments that you see either in the county or outside the county like the like the laurel project or mm -hmm. you know whether it be an apple sound center or a pearl or a wall chapel or maple lawn maple lawn's a great example right if there if there are those types of projects that you guys can reference and say you know we want to see something like that i think that that would be helpful a helpful recommendation yeah. keep, keep churning this we're going to revisit this when we get into our land use discussions as well and we can we'll get into it a bit more at that point. Let me just, in the interest of time, let me get us moving really quickly to the Cromwell station area, which is just outside of the Glen Burnie Town Center. Um, Plan 2040 placed this area in what's called a transit-oriented development policy area because of the light rail station, obviously. But I mean, that that development policy area calls for walkable, pedestrian-oriented mixed use areas. Um, it, it operates as an overlay development policy area. Now that's just policy, so it's not zoning in and of itself, but it, it does need to be compatible with the surrounding area and the underlying policy area, which is neighborhood preservation. So kind of thinking about the adjacent, you know, single family development um, types of patterns surrounding um, anything that happens on this site ideally would be compatible with that with that context there. Um, really quickly, um, this diagram just shows some of the, the opportunities and the features that are you know a, around the site. There was a transit-oriented development study that was prepared by our Office of Transportation. And so this is 
what that um, has come from. But the the Cromwell Field Shopping Center to the to the right there, across from the light rail station, a lot of vacancies, a large kind of underutilized parking area. Um, Wes, I think you had said some long term leases were recently signed for that. Yeah, so for, site. for so, a while, this um, this was the former giant um, food grocery store here, and that um, they vacated that to do a brand new store up the road. Um, for, for a while, that was a big vacancy there, and that kind of affected, you know, anytime your anchor leaves, it, it affects the rest of, you know, your ability to, to lease the rest of the center. So that was a, and we were in a situation there where, you know, Giant wasn't physically there anymore, but they were still, they still had years remaining on their lease, so they're still paying rent. So the landlord was like, we're still getting paid, so we don't care. Um, but that space has just been filled, um, which is a good thing. And they've done a decent job of backfilling some of their vacancies. It's still not the most beautiful shopping center and could use some work. Um, I think the owners are interested in, in um, you know, making it look nice and they've done some uh, improvements over the years a little bit, little by little, but um, you know, this Wendy's is, has been vacant. There's a new uh, group that's going in there out of food use, unfortunately. Um, are there pad sites available still? No. Not on, not on the site. What, what backfill giant? Um, AutoZone or um, one of those online site distribution. What backfill bank that's sitting there in the middle? The bank is still operating, I believe. No, the is bank that, is closed because when True is merged. Oh, that was one of the truest ones. That was the truest bank, and they, it's no longer operational. So that could, that could be. Um, Potentially to do something with Starbucks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Never have enough of those. <laughs> there is um, a large, just to point out to you, the large um, undeveloped site that's kind of to the left of the of the Catholic school there is slated for a, um, a DPW operations facility um, there. So that's a that's a large undeveloped area that is kind of spoken for at this point. But this is going to replace what. This is the 7409 yeah. DNA Boulevard property that we talked about previously. Um, this was a DPW operation, so a lot of that's going to move over to this site. This is also within that Glen Burnie Sustainable Community overlay zone, so there are some additional allowances and flexibility in terms of uses that, that are currently available, but I think, I don't know what thought, well, to kind of get well, some, go we ahead. We should talk about the Carmel Light Rail Station, too. Because I think that's, that's probably ahead. the biggest opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, I think in, in this map here, I think this is the biggest opportunity. Again, this is privately owned. This uh, light rail station is owned by the state. Um, and the Greater Washington Partnership did a study um, regionally. Uh, I can... There we go. Is that it? Uh, uh, yes, before? they did a study and identified um, three um, potential TOD sites in the county, one was Odenton, which is which is underway. The planning for that um, uh, TOD is is currently underway there at the Mark Station, um, Laurel Racetrack or Laurel Park, um, and and that um, that train station there was another one, uh, and this was the third uh, Conwell uh, light rail station. So you can see, obviously, it's a pretty big um, lot. It's pretty underutilized, I would say, on a day-to-day -day basis outside of maybe a, a Ravens game day. Um, it's very underutilized, so um, there's definitely potential to um, to do some sort of a transit-oriented development there. And we had an additional slide just to, again, kind of get some potentially creative, you know, juices flowing. This is a redevelopment out of um, California that just shows on, Previously underutilized commercial area on the on the left, built in the in the sixties or so, um, housing that was was sort of worked into this site, um, including workforce and affordable housing. Um, and you can kind of see on the right, it it, it went over and above um, some of the the retail um, that was on the site as well. So that was that was one. Um, opportunity or one one concept in another locale that perhaps could be appropriate in this area as well. But what do you all have any thoughts on this site and how it might relate and 
what opportunities there I might think be. The housing would be the best use of the area. I was going to say, I think crime is a big concern there with the light rail. I know they've had a lot of um, incidents in that shopping center. And I think that that deters some of these people that might be um, the anchors to get people to come there. The businesses probably don't like it because of the crime situation there as well. I think they've had to bring in security to sort of police the parking lot a little bit. I've seen I've seen like uh, security trucks kind of driving around. So that might be one of those chicken and egg things. Like, is it going to be a safe place and then we move in or do we make it safe so people can move it in? Or is there a way that we could make it so that it was or feels safer? Mm -hmm. I think the comfort and safety um, aspects, because they did have a lot of like break-ins and stuff in there. So that's a key, a key thing to be addressed. Yes. So the break-ins were at the... Light rail stations? No, across from it in the in the shopping areas the there. Shop. I, think there's a, I think there's a perception of you know, there's a tenant in there, the plasma place. Yes. There's a there's a perception that people come on the light rail and 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 go to frequent that place and might loiter a little too much and you know start to you know cause havoc in that in that shopping center. And yeah. it's that it's that tenant that's sort of bringing in um, the loiterers. Is it potential to do what Aronda Mills did when when they brought the um, that mobile unit there during a substation? Not a substation. They 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 had you could do a substation, but I think well, that's a, do it on a substation in Aronda Mills. It's on it's on the inside. Well, Aronda Mills has significantly more funding to to do, do that, that type so. of policing and have a substation than than a shopping center like this would. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's other there's funding sources that pay for that where this this wouldn't have that plasma thing is a chicken or an egg though it it truly yeah. mm -hmm. it it truly and it is it is a known entity you can drive into communities and you can say I bet there's a plasma station here and I think the light rail is <laughs> is a you know it's a double edged sword as well I mean I think as much as people you know like the idea of having um, access to transportation and direct access into the city and and stuff like that. Um, you know, the other side of that too is, you know, it also it also brings um, it's more accessible to people to come and 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 commit crimes and stuff like that. Um, so it is a bit of a double edged sword. But you know, overall, I think that supporting more transit oriented development in the county is a good thing. And you know, hopefully, we can find some way to take advantage of that and make it a good thing. The green areas there, are they just like that I see on the map? Are there just like um, vegetation in there? Or what's in the green area? Is the wetlands space. open space? Drainage? Yeah, so this is this is mostly wetlands right here. And it wouldn't really be developable. Same with this. Um, this is all neighborhood, obviously. This is a uh, uh, slave school. So you cannot, can you get from the light rail to BWI from Cromwell or do you got to go up in the lunch come in and go a different route? You got you yeah, to transfer. Yeah, well, you've got to go on the right train. There are, there are trains that go from Cromwell to directly to the airport, but you have to make sure you're on the right one. If you're not, then you then you get off and you transfer. I think, and, I think I don't know if there, maybe there, there were, but just from recently just taking it, it's like there's, you have to go up to, this is going to understand why it's one. so close. Why at the end of the line, or if we couldn't get a line right out to BWI from there, because that would change everything in that area. For Lenticum has so much of the airport um, workers and the pilots are all every and the flight attendants and all they're all just in different houses. They rent houses in Lenticum because um, they can they walk right to the light rail. And get on a light rail with their bags and go right to the um, to the airport. So if there was a access for town center and the and the Cromwell area to go right to BWI instead of around BWI and back in the other way, it would help transient. You know, to get people into even people coming into BWI to to be able to come into into the Glen Burnie town center for. Um, you know, uh, delays and for, you know, when they're, you know, to 
to leave the airport and do something or whatever. It yeah. would mm -hmm. to make it more trans, you know, transit oriented for that area. And this is not that far away from the Glenbury Town Center. No, and right? I mean, you can't we, walk we, there without getting hit. That most we, there's no sidewalk. Too. You need to make it more pedestrian friendly, right? If you got to cross the street. You got to cross the street down at Fort 7409 yep. and go up to Amico to the corner where Wendy's is. Yep. And then you got to cross back over. So you got to you got to cross B&A twice to yep. get to Cromwell Station. Mm -hmm. like I think that's a good point is if we are really yeah, going mean, to make this, is great this a driver right to the town so center. And I can't make the town center a great a great a great Man, thing that people are going to want to get to. We do need to make it more walkable and invested. And sidewalks. Uh, so kind of linking the, the town center, center and that. Yeah, five. And that's oh, the goal, right? I think it would be great to link close. the town center all the way there. Yeah. See, that would help. That would help seventy four or nine too. Yes. You know, for access to, you know, to get to DC or to get to Baltimore on, like even to Cromwell to the train station at BWI. I mean, because then you're totally transit, mm -hmm. and you can't get there without going up and the length coming and coming back around. Yeah, and even when you get to BWI, with the light roller drops you off, you have to take. Oh, see, I've never done. So you you take transit, a bus to take that to the train. So you, you could walk, get but from can you get from the light you rail to the train? Train? Yeah, you would want to, to the. Can you get from the light rail to the line to the right. main uh, mark, to the mark that takes thing? you? DC or New York. There there is a bus that goes. But there's no light rail. No, there. no, mm -hmm. not not directly. See, I know that's a little out of our region, but it would help region three significantly. Mm -hmm. And just to give reference for what you were just saying, like from from the intersection with um with Anne Arundel Community College at uh at B and A um to the Cromwell, it's only a uh, three quarters of a mile. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been a, it's, well right I now. Mean, people come, my office is right across from 7409. Yeah. And I mean, people come off the light rail and walk down in the Glen Burnie, but it's not the safest mm -hmm. because no, you can't get past the old Heimbrooks right. on our side. Yeah. But that would walkability from Cromwell to town center would be helpful from not only Cromwell, but from the Cromwell Plaza, too. Uh, just want to make sure we're conscious of the time. I know you did want to leave like 10 minutes for the... Yeah. Let me... Time. Can we really quickly talk about a third site? Um, and this will be really quick because we actually don't know a whole lot <laughs> about where we're going with this one, but this is out on the Marley Neck Peninsula. It is just across the line on re in Region 1. But um, the Brandon Shores Power Plant, it is scheduled to be deactivated in June of 2025. Potentially, that date could be delayed based on energy stability and, and needs. Um, we, so it seems a little bit up in the air. I don't, I don't know that there's a whole lot of information about when and, and what would happen there. But if that does happen... This would be a large area that's available for some sort of redevelopment. It's currently zoned W, I think it's W3 is the current zoning. Um, and um, this has shipping and rail access. So as, as that kind of an industrial site in the county, it's pretty important. But, um, you know, th there are some other um, sites that it, it might, provides just, just some thinking um, in, other, in other parts of the country, um, you know, redeveloping for more like warehousing and distribution types of, of things that take advantage of the existing transportation, you know, infrastructure, but that, you know, then puts more trucks on the road that go through your neighborhoods in, you know, in region three um, versus a kind of a mixed use type of, um, development. And this is a, a redevelopment site, or these are two redevelopment sites out of Oregon and Washington. You kind of see some different levels of, of um, intensity in each of each of those, a little bit lower intensity on the left. But, um, it, you know, this type of redevelopment, it increases the, the development costs, but, um, you know, it, it's, 
it's another idea that is, is out there. But um, I just wanted to at least put that out there for, for you all to be thinking about. Go ahead. Is this another one that's owned by a private company? Yes, it's not okay. county owned or state. It's not county owned already or anything. Uh, is there any more background that you have? I don't know that there is. No, I, the only other thing I wanted to say was that uh, and you mentioned it's zone W3, but just to give some context to that, that's the like most intense industrial yeah. use that's allowed under our code. Um, so you see a lot of super heavy industrial uses in W3. Um, and we, we don't have a lot of W3 land uh, in the county. So you know, I, I do think that you know uh, our redevelopment would be great here. I do hate to lose W3 land and give it up to a use that's not necessarily mm -hmm. Uh, W3, but, um, you know, certainly those two examples would be great economic drivers. You'd be lucky to have it. First question, who's going to clean that up? If there's a power plant there now. You know that there's a problem. Yeah. That was one of the things I neglected to say. That yeah. factors into the costs. Yeah. So the EPA costs are going to be in there. So there are definitely are a lot of developers that specialize in, in redeveloping those types of sites. Mm -hmm. uh, Sparrows Point is a great example of that. I mean, if you looked, if you saw what that was before, yeah, I know what it was before. I mean, it's it was a that was a mess, and that was a big undertaking. And um, certainly, there's a lot of federal programs that um, try to help offset those costs. But there are definitely developers that specialize in in remediating sites like that. And I think that if you know something was going to happen here, it'd be it'd be one of those guys that have, has a lot of experience in dealing with that type of remediation. Is this property, um, I, I apologize, I can't envision it. Where does it fit in adjacencies to the Curtis Bay incineration facility that's getting closed and has all the issues also? It's closer to Pasadena. Down It's just down more. Well, I'm, see if I I'm just wondering, like, is it something that the two could be grouped together for a larger play? No, I was wondering if are they deactivating because the Brandon Shores company doesn't want to be there anymore, or because it can't be an industrial electric site like it is, or do we know like why it's deactivating? If it's a coal plant, they're trying to shut down the coal yeah. plants. I think that I think that's right. I think it's more yeah. of a regulatory. Mm -hmm. They can't keep up with the regulatory requirements, and I think it's so it could stay W three with a new industrial type of mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. We need most of W three. More W the W three, or do we need more residential? I mean, can we bring businesses? Yeah, you know, employment centers, bigger yeah. industrial employment stuff. I mean, I certainly think like a fulfillment center. Or something. I mean, industrial market right now is is super good in 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 Orange County, especially. But you know, regionally, it's it's really. I mean, you saw the the vacancy rates before. I mean, I think this region was what at three three something, and that's so you can see the um, average of the county, the the density surrounding it. You know, so do you make it another village of Wall Chapel, um, so that the people of Tanyard have somewhere to go shopping? Or do you do the um, leave it as W three and attract more businesses with the waterfront? Is it on the waterfront? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, you can make it like a Meriwether Post, but like restaurants. I'm wondering if we're gonna lose some land there with rising sea levels. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Canada's Curtis mm -hmm. Bay. It definitely needs some more green. It's just so ugly the way it is. There's a lot of water around it too, right? Yeah. West. Yeah, to the to the north of that you have um thinking of like yeah, Swan Creek Business Park right here. Uh which is, again, there's there's really no vacancy but but even right around Fort Smallwood Road over towards Tanyard, that's all business. Yeah, so this, that's is all a, where... this is Brandon Woods business park. Um this was sort of the earlier one. Yes. This is the most recent development where they did a, um, a Best Buy, um, Amazon's down here sure. too. Sure. Um, and they, they're just breaking sure. ground on the last parcel here. Um, so there's another warehouse building coming out of the ground too, but this is a very successful um, industrial business park. So certainly if they, if they went that route and kept it industrial, um, they'd have no problem attracting tenants. Is there um, value to doing industrial with solar? 
like to create solar farms? All, like rooftop solar? Yeah. All throughout this re that area? Um, yeah, we've I've talked to a lot of industrial uh, developers that, that build these types of buildings. And obviously when you have a rooftop that big, that's ideal for, for solar. Um, and I think it's difficult for them. What I've heard is it's difficult for developers to uh, incorporate solar if they're building the warehouse without knowing who the tenant's going to be, um, because different tenants, um, you know, have um, uh, different requirements for their roof and roof penetrations and things like that. And you just don't know where it's going to be, so it's hard to incorporate that from the from the start. But that said, if somebody wanted to, now that there is a tenant in there, go back and add solar. I think there's a lot of potential for that. It's worth. I mean, it's a subsidizing and then offset the grid. Mm -hmm. Maybe this is another area since there are so many warehouses where you can have those big like indoor soccer field part in lacrosse and like it's on the water once it's cleaned out and you can have some sort of like a a food type place where people can come and visit. It's, it's like not like learning center. Yeah. yeah. Decommissioned. So so are you thinking kind of like take advantage of that waterfront but yeah I a destination sure. type of place as well as yes. harbor. They did down there. They renovated that whole area. Mm -hmm. I do think it looks very area. industrial around there, but I guess that's what you change. But it's not like yeah. the prettiest right. looking that's what spot Harbor was. there to but look But even if you don't leave it, okay. but even if you're just doing like big, like think of like indoor tennises, indoor indoor pickleballs, indoor like, I don't know, like. Make a great concert venue. <laughs> so from an economic yeah. standpoint, is it, since it's already zoned as that special to use, Giving that up, there are economic mm -hmm. consequences for giving that up. Yeah. You can't but it's, it's just there's such a, a lack of that zoning in the, in the, county. In the county already. You know, it's tough to give that up. If I could chime in on that, I feel like sorry, I'm also from economic development, but um, you know that that industrial thing of that heavy level is it like West that is very rare, um, and those tend to be high paying jobs, right? That that further our tax base and so from yeah there is a huge economic impact when you start losing that land you're never going to get it back you know, you know once you once you up zone um heavy industrial you're never going to get that heavy industrial you lose it for pretty much forever so i think you know traditional economic development would say you want to try to retain especially at that size you can't find you know any any heavy industrial land of that sizable we so it could be you know when they decommission it that you know, we go out and we look for um, some type of user that would bring jobs and you know create revenue for the county. And again, from an investment standpoint, this is another one where and you and you, and you hit it on the head. Like there's going to be a lot of money that has to go into remediating the site before you even put a shovel in the ground. Mm -hmm. That's a huge investment. So anything that's going to happen here is going to have to be a revenue generator. Would the county um, is is the preference for the county to bring in a tenant to do that remediation, or would the county entertain doing the remediation to raise the property value to then sell? Well, the county doesn't own the property, so the county wouldn't get involved. That's good. What's the but once it's decommissioned? I I think it's such an early stage right now that it, it's kind of premature to even know that at this point. Um, we wanted to kind of bring it up just to put it on your radar. And, and the plan may end up with some kind of a broad type of recommendation that, you know, is something along the lines of work with, you know, all of the, the key stakeholders and engage the community in the future of this site and something that is, you know, maintains the tax base and all of, all of the things that we just talked about. Um, with, with more of that to be fleshed out as as this moves forward. Yeah. I, I just wanted to at least bring it up and put it on your radars. It's a very interesting point. site. It is interesting. We're we got literally one minute. Um, Jason, do you want to call for public any oh. public comments? I doubt we do. Do we have it. anyone on the line? I don't think we have anyone in the room. Uh, anyone on the line for public comment? Um, no, there's no one. No. So then I guess we are. I pass. Okay. <laughs> You're the one public. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, next steps in the journey. 
Oh, um, I think I have a question. Yeah, you have a slide for that. No, I have a good question. Okay. Okay. 15 more okay. slides. Well, I, I think we kind of talked about this already. So the draft strategies for the natural environment, those are out until January 2nd. If you all want some graphics, email us, let us know. We can send them to you. You can post them on Facebook or next door or whatever it is that you do. Our next advisory committee meeting is January 9th. Um, and that's at the Severn Library. Um, Desiree mentioned that we're going to do a drop-in session um, for economic development and housing. It'll be after our next meeting. That's January 30th. We don't know where yet. Um, that's all I have at this point. Thank you. All right, we're adjourned, I guess. Happy holidays. Happy New Year. Happy holidays, everyone. Thank you all very much. Thank you all. Well, you're going to send out the uh, invites, the calendar invites yeah. for on the right. Uh, uh, yes, we will. We will send out calendar invites for for all of these meetings, so you can get them on the calendar if that works for you all. It might have been I your email. I watch every. I said yes to the calendar invite. So I have one of mine. I can get everybody. I know, I've been on my phone. Okay. Okay. We will watch. Okay. 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 Okay.